No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> Arguments are an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic game saying of anything the other person says. No, it isn't. Yes, it yes, is. It no, it isn't. isn't. <laughs> no, look. Thank you. Arguments are an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic game saying of anything the other person says. Everybody here today. I don't think I've ever had this many people on a panel show for my show. We got round two coming up. Welcome to the Rational Mail live from uh, Reno, Nevada, uh, New York City, New York City, Las Vegas, Nevada. I don't know where Andrew's from, and uh, Toronto, Canada, Ontario, wherever Ryan is from. One of those French, gay, Canadian places. Save the West today. You guys ready to save the West? Oh, yeah. Before we get started, we have to have one, only one video today. Just the one. It's too good not to. For better, for better, for worse, for worse, for, for richer, richer, for richer, for poorer, for poorer. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we hit Destinag about 20 times in counseling. Brill made it very clear to Jonathan, you cannot be broke. In sickness, in sickness, and in health, and in health, to love, to love, cherish, cherish, and to obey. <laughs> we didn't talk about that one in council. We did talk about that in council. Yes, we did. So you want me to repeat that again? You want to just keep going? I think we can keep going. All right. <laughs> there you go. Oh man, look who I got today. You can unmute yourselves, please feel free. <laughs> Sorry, James, I know I use that on your show. <laughs> uh, that well, the reason I like to use that as an intro for shows like this is because it's I it's it's meant to be comedy. I get it, but it's also kind of endemic of what really marriage has become these days. It's a, sort of a one sided, almost like a Steve Harvey kind of yuck it up type uh, uh, situation at this point, and. Um, I, I think I made this point when we were uh, talking, James, was uh, the fact that that's funny at all is simply because we, we have such a gynocentric um, perspective when it comes to marriage today. And that's kind of what I wanted to jump off with today. I've got Ryan Stone, who is in Ontario or Toronto or Wichita. Toronto. <laughs> yeah, we don't do syllables up here. You don't Tirana. do Toronto. Yes. I got Michael Captain, my captain, my captain. Uh, Michael Sartain is in the house. He's in Las Vegas, um, the proprietor of Men of Action, which, by the way, if you want to join, use my link. <laughs> I got James uh, Sexton, who is hot off of his uh, interview with uh, Lex Friedman. I want to ask you a little bit about that and see how that how that went for you. Uh, Glenn Lawrence, he was with us on uh, Rule Zero yesterday. I've got him today. And I've also got Andrew Wilson, my new best friend, Andrew Wilson, here today. And I know Andrew is... Um, is simulcasting today so i just wanted a big shout out to your audience because i usually whenever you're on with like destiny or you're on with some other show i'm always watching yours instead of the other one that's going on <laughs> it's much more interesting because <laughs> all of your little asides where you like mute the where you mute the uh the uh, the mic and then you kind of like talk about stuff and by the way you still owe me 10 bucks for uh, toxic oh, masculinity that's what that yeah, was i do owe I you 10 bucks it's true <laughs> That's what that was. Andrew, I didn't understand what you were doing. We were sitting there talking to Destiny, and then he would just mute himself and start talking. I was like, is his wife in there? Is he yelling at somebody? Like, what was going on? I didn't know that's what you were doing. That's genius. Yes. That is genius. That was funny. So, I, was, well, I was making fun of you guys. Is what yeah. I'm, okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. I have no doubt. I know. Yeah. But it was entertaining as hell, I, was, I will say. <laughs> but it was good. All right, guys. I wanted to get into this today because uh, I, don't, I felt like we didn't get enough of it last uh, yesterday. 
And uh, Mikey weren't with us, but we were doing Rule Zero yesterday. And um, I was I wanted to launch in here because I was uh, I've been locking horns recently with guys like Michael Knowles, uh, Matt Walsh, who, by the way, is invited to. I, I sent him the uh, the Streamyard link to this show, so if you uh, if he or his handlers allow it, um, uh, he might even actually show up. Could we'll you imagine? See. Could you imagine? Great. Please, please, Matt, I'm begging you. We will no, be talking to legal right now. He, he's not allowed to do this shit. Are you yeah, kidding I'm, me? I'm he's sure. He's got to talk to his three lawyers and his handler. <laughs> and he's got to make sure that he's got to make sure Ben Shapiro's cool with it. Like, he can't just come on here. You Hello, if Matt comes, play the promo. Oh, oh yeah. Say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Most definitely. I, you know, it's like, I, I'll tell you, of all those guys, Matt's the Matt's probably the one I would want to talk to the most. Uh, Noel, Michael Knowles just seems sort of like he just hits it and quits it kind of thing. He just like whatever's if it's a slow news cycle, he'll go. Yeah. And those Red Hill guys suck. And then he knows he's going to get like, I'm going to go. <gasps> OK. Um, or else it's um, uh, who was oh Jeremy Boring was actually oh, that Jeremy Boring. The other the other half of Ben Shapiro uh, on uh, Daily Wire. I didn't even think he was a thing. I didn't even know he was uh, he was actually a personality. I thought he was just more of like a silent partner and all that. But I guess he's uh, I guess he's a um, actually somebody you know, as far as like a personality or whatever. But I'm seeing a lot of this come from the sort of tradcon side of the uh, of the spectrum now. And the reason why I wanted to get into this now is because I wanted to sort of be able to sort of uh, have had this conversation before we're having it like full scale in the 2024 election cycle, because I will tell you right now that a lot of the stuff that we're going to get into today, you will hear repeated endlessly uh, by uh, traditional conservative. Well, I guess what well, uh, was it a uh, Stephen Crowder called it Big Con. So I'm pretty sure Big Con is these are going to be the themes for Big Con. Uh, going forward into the 2024 election cycle, how that plays out, I don't know. But uh, as I was saying before, when um, we, we were doing the end of the year show last year for Rule Zero, I, I mentioned this. I said, you know, you're not going to be able to recognize the manosphere or the red pill by August. And if anything, I think I was probably uh, premature with that. I, or, or I was a little late on that because it seemed like by about June or July, everybody wanted to abandon the red pill. And, and especially the people who had made it their bread and butter for the last you know, year, 18 months. And so now, now it's cool to hate on the red pill, which of course follows suit because it's exactly what happened in 2016. And it's exactly the same thing that happened in 2020. So uh, I, it's nothing that I'm, I'm not prepared for, but I want to sort of get out ahead of this and I want to have a good a good discussion here because I think that this is going to be a um, uh, I don't even think it's so much a, a clash of ideologies as it is a a clash of you know fact versus fact versus fact, and that's why I wanted to have I want to kind of start off with James here. Um, I, I wanted to get into the first versus uh, some of the stats here. One of them was the uh, the rate of divorce, and we talked about this yesterday. And so if you can just fill us in on some of this stuff, because I the reason why I'm asking this first is I was, again, talking or sort of locking horns with uh, Matt Walsh here. And he well, didn't want to um, to uh, I guess it was maybe it was Pearl who said something like this. I, I can't remember. But he was basically responding to somebody who said that the failure rate of marriage was 75 percent. And I don't think that that's accurate. So, <clears throat> yeah. So. Yeah. For us. So I, I think numbers are important. And I think, um, you know, I enjoyed yesterday's conversation on, on Rule Zero a lot. And I, I especially enjoyed talking to Andrew to the point where I actually tweeted after the show yesterday saying how much I enjoy a debate with someone who knows what the hell they're talking about. And it's obvious mm -hmm. that he does know what he's talking about and that he's done some research. So I figured in anticipation of today, though, like all good lawyers that I would do a little research and I would get the most current numbers I could possibly give. So um, I think it might be nice to start off with some statistics and then we can kind of put them wherever we want to put them. But all of these are easy to find online, CDC, whatever your opinions are, the CDC in terms of the, 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 the compilation of statistics from the Bureau of Vital Statistics. This is from August of 2023. And I want to just throw some concepts and some numbers out at you because look, you know, we're always being told it's a Ben Shapiro favorite thing to say, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, you know, the, the feelings don't care, you know, feelings don't care about facts either, you know. So the, the truth is, I understand there's a lot of feelings involved in marriage things. Everybody's caught up on the idea of like, you know, I, I think people like these straw men, you know, when you were talking, uh, Rolo, about, about how this pops up around every election cycle. 
You know, of course, these kinds of straw man arguments come up around every election cycle. You know, why do politicians on the state level love talking about how they're hard on drunk drivers? Because is there a big pro DWI group out there somewhere like mothers for yeah. drunk driving? <laughs> you know, everyone's you know, why do we have such oppressive and unbelievably vicious anti-domestic violence legislation out there on the books that's catching tons and tons of men in the net? Um, again, you know, I can tell you, intimate partner abuse, domestic violence, those are real things. But that's not why we have so many laws in the books that are anti-domestic violence. It's because there's no pro-domestic violence lobby out there. So it's very safe for any politician, whichever side of the aisle they're on, getting up and saying, I am against domestic violence. Well, Lottie fucking dies. There are a lot of people out there going, I'm pro-domestic violence. It's, it's a ridiculous argument. So it's the same thing now. What is this year's flavor? This year's flavor is I am for happy marriages. Well, who the fuck is against happy marriages? Is there a group of people out there saying I'm against happy marriages? Because if you want to try to put that on the red pill, like that, that shoe just isn't going to fit. It's not like anyone in this community is saying, oh yeah, we, we think marriages suck and marriage as a technology is awful. And even if you're happy, Happily married, you should get unhappy and get divorced. That's a ridiculous argument. It's a straw man. So I, I, I think we should really be looking at facts. So let me throw a couple of statistics out here, a couple of facts, and then we can all figure out what to do with those. Because, you know, I, I love people who say they love America but hate Americans. And I love people who say that, you know, they, they care about, you know, uh, marriage satisfaction or the divorce rate, but all they want to do is just create barriers to getting out of unhappy marriages. They don't want to talk about the underlying causes for divorce. So let's talk about statistically what those causes are. And then anybody, particularly trad comp people that are saying, hey, we're really trying to support marriages. We want to end divorce. Cool. Instead of creating bigger barriers to divorce, and making my job more lucrative as a divorce lawyer, maybe you can do some of these things that'll shore up helping people's marriages. So let's look at some statistics. So in terms of divorce rates, yeah, divorce rates, when people say 73% or in the 70s, yes, third marriages, if you're married three times, third time is not a charm, 73% divorce rate for third marriages, 67% mm. divorce rate for second marriages, 52% divorce rate for first marriages. Now, this is the statistics as of 2021 because it takes the year for them to compile the statistics. So in 2023, you get the numbers that reflected the year of 2021, not 2022. Um, so when you average it out, that's where you get this number of 56% marriages and in divorce is that they're averaging out, but they're not giving the same weight to all three of those things. But it's 52% for first marriages, 67% for second marriages, 73% for third marriages. 40% of new marriages include a partner who is remarrying. So the majority of marriages, 60% are first marriages for both partners, but as many as 20% of unions are one person who's been married before. So again, remember some of these statistics are a little tricky when you look at the divorce rate because you're talking about people who've been married multiple times, okay? Only 6% of divorced couples remarry each other. So I guess once you've seen the movie, you don't wanna see it again. Um, but interestingly enough, 72% of reuniting couples who remarry each other after divorcing each other stay married, which is really weird. Mm. Um, okay, this is a really interesting statistic. I'm going to be really interested to hear everybody's perspective on this. Having friends who are divorced dramatically increases your risk of divorce. Okay. Yeah. So couples who have friends who divorce have a 75% increase in their own marriage risk. Okay, and even Your couples with two friends. degrees of separation. Well, that's because of this. There's a lot of sociologists that say that that divorce is a social contagion of sorts. So I thought that was very, very interesting. And just a couple other stats I want to throw out there. Couples who live together before marriage are more likely to divorce. Okay, so that's something that Christian conservatives and, and other religious individuals who say many trad cons who are of a religious perspective, even if someone's not religious, they might say, hey, look, you know, the biblical covenants that say people shouldn't be married or living together before they're married or having premarital sex. There is actually some statistical evidence to support the fact that parties who uh, are a total of 57 percent of couples who did not cohabitate prior to marriage had a union that lasted 20 or more years compared to 46 percent who lived together before tying the knots. So that's a 10 percent difference. That's significant. This is something I, I, I saw yesterday after the conversation with Andrew that I thought was really, really interesting um, because it's something where Andrew and I were in agreement. Um, and that is uh, over 70% of couples report not understanding the realities or stages of marriage. Mm. Okay, so this is people who are divorcing 
72% of them reported, and it's self-reporting obviously, okay, that one or both of them didn't fully understand the commitment involved in marriage before they got married. And that goes to Andrew's point yesterday that I very much agreed with about how there maybe should be better barriers to entry into the covenant of marriage. Maybe this is something that you shouldn't be able to do for 20 bucks with Elvis um, marrying you. Uh, in Nevada, by the way, highest divorce rate in the United States. Um, now, here's something that I don't think you're going to hear out of all of these politicians while they continue to have their hands in your pockets. Divorce rates are much higher among couples below the poverty line. Living below the poverty level, we all know, causes tremendous stress on people. Okay, 46% of adults ages 18 to 55 who live below the poverty level have divorced. Okay, so that's a fairly significant number compared to 12%. Okay, so that's a pretty huge number. Um, and then also income. The divorce rate decreases as income increases to a point. Okay, so couples, as their income increases, the divorce rate tends to decrease. Once you have an income of around $200,000 as a combined household income, you stay at about 30%. Once it hits 600,000 of income, it drops to 25%, okay? But once it exceeds that, it goes back up to 30%. So wow. the idea is you should be rich, but not really rich, okay? Like you should have a good amount of money, but not, and definitely don't be poor, because being poor would be bad. Again, so, so these are some questions about what are these things we can solve for if we're really that concerned about saving marriage. Um, the median first age of first marriages is increasing. In 2022, the median age of marriage was 32 for men, 30 for women. Jeez. So let's just tie yeah, that in with the biological. <laughs> yeah, let's tie. I know, I know that uh, uh, Rola is going to have a blast tying that in with the biological reality of when people have babies. Mm -hmm. um, but to put that in perspective, in 2012, Okay, 2012, so we're going, because these are 2022 statistics, let's go back 10 years. The average age for a woman was 26 and for a man it was 28. So look at that jump in 10 years. Look at how much that's changed, okay? Yeah. And then the average <clears throat> age of people who divorce, 46 for men, 44 for women. Couples who marry, this is a great one, before age 32 have the lowest divorce rates, but it has to be from 20 to 32. If you marry under the age of or at the age of 20, that's a higher divorce rate. Once you pass 32, the divorce rates increase by 5% per year until the age that they marry. So those are just some statistics. I mean, listen, there's a bunch more that I got for you guys in terms of educational levels. Obviously, the divorce rate for people with an education of high school or less is 39% for men, 37 for women. Whereas if you have a college education, 26% for men. So 26 versus 39 and 37 for women versus 30. So the, the, the trope that some people have in their minds that you know an educated woman is gonna be more likely to divorce, that's actually not true. The lower the education level for women and for men, the higher the likelihood of divorce. So that's a very interesting statistic. And then I wanted to end on, because I know we have some religious uh, people on the panel today and I have a tremendous respect for religion. Um, but the religion with the lowest divorce population is Hindu. Mm. So if we're very much pro-marriage, we need to get people out there. We need to evangelize for the I Hindus. Swear. Because unfortunately, the highest divorce population is evangelical Protestants. So the evangelical Protestants are going to, they're way far behind okay. the Hindus. Only 5% of Hindus report divorce. Okay, So we've got, as compared to... 14% uh, of evangelical Protestants getting divorced. Uh, but they are still doing better, by the way, than those who are unaffiliated or not religious. That's 11%. 11% um, is, is uh, so, so being religious does um, increase your chances of remaining married, particularly if you're Hindu. Now, let me uh, let me throw in a, a couple of caveats here, first of all, because we got I, I also want to be able to separate this by um, by socioeconomic level, also uh, ethnicity and stuff like that as well, because like some of my stats are showing that, you know, if you are, I well, forget which, which one is it, it's, uh, uh, let's see, uh, among, uh, among race and Hispanic or of Hispanic origins, uh, ever, uh, ever married Asian women and men had the lowest proportion of ever divorced. So there is going to be a, a cultural, uh, ethnic, uh, variation in all of this as well, too. Not just, a, not just, uh, by religion. And the other thing is, is, um, what's the no, I, I, maybe I just don't have these stats available, but what is the most numerous, uh, 
religion on planet Earth? Is it Hindu or is it Christianity? Christianity, I I Christianity, Christianity, Christianity is the Christianity largest is like religion on Earth. Three billion yeah. or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so I was just wondering because like when I when I hear like something like well it's uh, you know more Hindus uh, stay married rather than like say Christians or whatever I, I gotta like also like take that with a grain of salt because you gotta remember the dis- uh, like the displacement or the dispersion. I, of all I, I think I think I think he was kind of I think he was kind of being funny. Like also they 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 lead the world in domestic abuse by far. Like it's not it's mm-hmm. not yeah it's not like he's talking about arranged marriages role. Like there's yeah. no way yeah that we're not we're not going to do that. And m- the majority of this country is Protestant, right? If you choose a religion, a weird well, I think. I think what I've said before is we're interested. I don't think we should just be interested in the divorce rate. I mean, look, I think divorce statistics are interesting, but I'm more interested in the marriage satisfaction rate. You know, if if, if Andrew and I'm not picking on you, Andrew, but if Andrew as a married person says to me, uh, yes, I've been married and I've stayed married, I don't consider that a victory. But if Andrew Mm. says to me, as I believe he would, you know, I'm married and I like being married and I've and look, I don't like it all the time. There's nothing anyone likes all the time. But I really think my life is better because I'm married. And I really think that my life would be, you know, again, you're speculating, but you're saying, you know what, I feel like my life is richer for the fact that I made this choice and that I entered into this status with another person. Then, then you got my interest. Because that's not just about making marriage into an endurance competition that, you know, you win if you manage to stay married, even if you're absolutely miserable. I, I, I'm much more interested in what can be done to support people's marriages, to make people happy to be married, not just that they'll hang in there and survive it. I don't think we should want, we shouldn't aspire to being on life support. I think we should aspire to having vibrant, healthy lives. So that, that's where I think our focus should probably be. I think the uh, I think really what we're going to get into today is really sort of like what are the stats, what's what's the reality of it, and then like sort of what do you do about it. So like what's I know we we were good, we got into like is and ought and and all that good stuff yesterday on on rule zero, but um, I think that perhaps like you know understanding like the nature of what we're dealing with here first that should be what is informing like what should we do about it, what are the best practices as a result of this. But Andrew, did you have something to say to any of this? <clears throat> I do. So <clears throat> I won't take as much time. I'm sorry. Um, but if you can give me a, a little bit of uh, time to respond to some of these points, let me start with something which was said yesterday, which I want to correct as well. I do agree with you that facts don't care about your feelings, I suppose. But I disagree with you that feelings don't care about facts. That seems silly to me. Um, but kind of moving into this, we were talking about no fault divorces yesterday and Rolo had brought up an argument and I, I guess it's his own correlatory data which shows that um, got it here. There you yeah, go. there you go. Uh, mm-hmm. Divorce rate and contraceptive use. But that seems to be nothing more to me than a correlation after looking into it myself. So uh, the first argument which came from uh, um, the lawyer of the panel was, don't you think that we should see a higher rate of divorce then when a no fault divorce is introduced like in New York? And the answer to that question is yes. I'm showing currently on my screen the stats for this. It is clear that the figure that almost immediately following no fault implementation, the divorce rate begins to undergo large increases in the specifics, which include no fault um, coefficients, takes on higher divorce rates than the specification, which restricts the effects of no fault laws. It shot up through the roof. That's one. The second thing I can kind of use to demonstrate this is that you are tracking this data going back to when uh, contraception first was introduced, which was actually 10 years prior to no-fault divorce. Mm -hmm. However, we have here an abstract from Mexico because Mexico introduced no-fault divorce between 2008, 2017. This is, uh, what, 40 years past contraception, and you see a 27% increase in their divorce rates almost immediately. We also have a study which comes in. This is Horowitz, and I can give you the highlights of this study as well. But he looking at four different studies which were analyzed by him for certain, they found the effects of no fault divorce caused massive increases across the board for divorce rates due to expediency. Another thing that a lawyer friend brings up, he says, wait a second. What about poor people getting divorced? Well, yeah. Wouldn't you want to have some kind of financial barrier, perhaps? Now, what could I say to back um, to back that up? This Horowitz study says, as the theory predicted, no fault laws are empirically found to have a high significant positive effects on divorce rates. Further, not only these laws found 
uh, to be significant in the short run, but also the long run. It goes on to clarify that if you have a financial barrier in the way of the divorce, you end up seeing far less divorces. And then it gives justifications for why that is. So I actually dispute this data by uh, by Rolo, mm -hmm. and I would like to get into kind of the no fault. He says marriage satisfaction, but I think that that's only one part of it. So I'd, I'd love to respond to that. Sure. Um, I, I, I think, Andrew, that you're, you're um, and while I appreciate the reliance on um, the numbers in terms of the numbers of divorces that are entered, okay? So when you say the divorce rate, you're not talking about the number of people that um, file divorce actions. You're talking about the entry of judgment of divorces. That's what finalizes a divorce, okay? So of course, I think literally every state, particularly California in 69 when they passed it, when Reagan passed it, who, by the way, was a conservative. I don't know if you guys recall. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, he did it for the same reason most states did it, which is to move through a backlog. Okay? There, there's a tremendous backlog. Divor the divorce process is a protracted process from a paperwork standpoint. Now, again, if you think, and, and this is not a logic I understand when applied to any number of things. Like, there are not a lot of heroin addicts out there going, you know, I want to use heroin. Oh, shit, wait, it's illegal. Ah, I guess I'm not going to do that. I, the, the fact that it takes a lot of paperwork to get divorced, more or less paperwork, is not going to be something that's going to cause people to continue to have happy marriages. And that's again, incorrect. Is and the I can goal? Hang, hang on. I, I, I think you're the. Well, listen, you can you demonstrate. Talk for a long, you can you demonstrate talk for a long time. numbers. Can we just do one point at a time? Well, Andrew, I, I can, but but here's the problem. You're still just spitting numbers, well, right? If you make a point. Devoid let's of one at a time. Andrew, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I was speaking. If you if you, you were want and then to, I was okay, you want to just just keep talking. I just want to do one point at a time so please. we can get through okay. it. Otherwise, we end okay. up with a gish gallop. Because you just scatter shot at about fifteen that are. I was all responding to fifteen of your points. Wow, man, you just is it that hard for you to let someone get a sentence in? Or are you just used to shooting fish in a barrel? Is that what you do? Like, because see, I used to doing this in court. And the way it works in court is there's a court reporter, and one person shuts the fuck up, and then when they're done, the other person starts talking. So that's well, called a debate. Point see, look, and you're up. doing it again, my friend. You're doing it again. At some point, so you, you have to stop talking, though. <laughs> buddy, if you think you're going to stonewall over me, you're just making yourself look it's foolish. It's steamroll, not stonewall. Okay, just, that would be the opposite okay, of steamroll. Okay, thank you. Well, you've really proved your point, Andrew. You got me on that one, man. Absolutely. Like, this is what you do. Like, I've watched your game, man. It's not I impressive mean, to anybody. Oh, I mean, there you go again. It's not a Vegas. <laughs> look, I... I, I want to have a respectful conversation with you because until you prove you're, you're not worthy. Time. Okay, keep going, man. You, you, Can we just me... do one point at a time? Why do, you, why do you evade? Just let's do one point at a time. We'll have a constructive debate that The way. guy who's interrupted me 15 times is saying because I'm trying you to evade. Gallop, oh, dude. Look, I'm trying to keep again. you on point. I'm trying to keep you on point. That's okay. it. Okay. You let me know when you finish, man. Okay, let me, set, let me set a timer. Let's actually physically see how long you talk. I, I, love, I love debate rules. Let's do it. We'll do Here point we and counterpoint. Ready? What, what, what time do you want? What time frame do you want to pick? How about one minute? Can you do it in one minute? One can you minute? make a point in one minute? Well, I think you can obfuscate the facts in one minute, which seems to be what you like to do. You, like what you like to do is just throw some numbers out there like you said something and then step back and go, well, you see, 42%. There it is right there. As if it means anything. 40 it seconds. doesn't. Oh, is this? Did you start the timer for us already, Andrew? Is that? Is this I'm just you hoping you'll make it, a man? point at some point so that I can actually respond to the point. Why don't Why don't we? St okay, so I'll tell you what. You pick the topic because you want us to go one at a time. Mm -hmm. You pick the topic. You set the preposition, and then I'll respond. Okay. okay. We'll do it. We'll, we'll do, we'll do your rule. Two minutes. I'll, whatever two rule minutes. set you two want, minutes. my friend. I, I, I am timer. ready to roll. I whatever rule set easy. you pick. All right. Let's let Let's let Glenn do the time. Go for it. Okay, yeah. so this is easy. I just want to start with the kind of the claim that you made for no-fault divorce. You said you can't understand in your mind why this would ever cause anybody to have a more productive divorce or more sad or a marriage or more satisfaction in their marriage, things like this. However, what I can demonstrate using this Harrowitz study when this was focused on, your exact point, what they state emphatically in this study is very clear. Those barrier to entries make and force the couples who are inside the relationship to begin some kind of reconciliation process while the paperwork is slowed down. So actually, there's a huge benefit to it. There you go, whole point made with time left on the clock. Can you respond to that? The, 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 okay, yeah. 
how how in the Horowitz study, okay, does does one measure marriage satisfaction while waiting for a pending divorce? Because I have to tell you, man, I love when people throw studies out like this and go, well, this study demonstrated that people are much, much happier when they do X, Y, and Z. What in fuck's name are you talking about, man? What was the gauge for happiness? Was it self-report by both parties, one party? Which was it? And you're the one who threw this study out there. So back this thing up. I mean, just saying like, would you like it if I went, oh, Anthony Fauci said this, so it must be fucking true. Like, let's tie it down. You just talked about a specific thing. You just said that people's barriers to, entry, to removal of marriage Okay, increases the likelihood of people reaching a satisfactory resolution that makes them want to continue to stay married. That's your preposition. What That's is correct. the data that supports that? What? Just wh how did they measure that? Yeah. You're the one cite the study. I no, hope you read you, it. Yeah, so I'll give you the, the metrics on this from the Harowitz study. So if you're taking uh, pre-no-fault divorce, we can look at marriage from 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can look at the satisfaction rates which people are reporting from staying married. They have to stay married because now there's a barrier to exit. Just like there, you want a barrier for entry, a uh, more supportive barrier for entry. I also want that, but also a barrier for exit because it forces couples to reconcile. It actually forces them to begin a reconciliation pro uh, process why they're cohabitating. So what the outcomes for the people themselves, to me, are actually far less important than the outcomes for the children. The children's outcomes are what we should be focusing on more than anything else, not just the outcomes of the mommy and daddy and their personal satisfaction rate. Don't you agree? I, I have to say, when this is done, I'd like everyone to just rewind the exchange that just happened and watch Andrew just absolutely not answer my direct question and simply instead reiterate the exact same thing he previously said, which is that the marriage satisfaction rate, which I asked him, how is that measured? It's measured by metrics. Oh, okay, that's really helpful. It's measured by metrics, right? That's how studies work is things are measured. What metrics? Self-reporting? Is there some outside observer looking at these people are happy? And then rather than answer the question, you pivoted, love it, and then went, Children, but children, which is a great one. Conservatives love that one, but the kids, right? So instead of answering the question, which was specifically asked, because we're doing one at a time, because that's how you wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Then you said, you didn't answer it. And then you said, but you know, it, it also affects children and totally pivot to another topic, which is children. Yes, okay, we can talk about children later on, but you're the one who wants to go one at a time. Again, I'll ask you, what is the metric by which they are measuring a happy, satisfaction rate that leads to any kind of because again all you're simply saying is when you make it harder to get divorced people get divorced less frequently right that seems pretty sensible when you put locks on doors people don't go through those doors as easily but does that mean that they should stay in the burning house is that a good thing so the metrics i just told you what the metrics were they were able to go back and look at previous data based on the self-reporting of those people. And they were able to determine these happiness metrics in the Horowitz study. I literally told it to you and I showed it on screen. Not only that, just to kind of uh, move on from there, just so that you understand this is extremely important that we have comparative data for this. When we're looking at this, at this data, we're looking for these strong correlatories. We know that the outcomes for children are far better when the parents remain intact in a two-parent household and married even if their marriage they don't report high satisfaction rates inside their own marriage the outcomes for the children still better this is what's called a compound argument it's not a singular factor because we're looking at a lot of different data points here so i do have a study i have given you what the study is i've told you who it's by i've told you the metrics that they used and i've told you what their findings on no-fault divorce are and i would like for you to tell me why it is that you think that no fault divorce and this is your claim that that's not the problem that's not the issue there's some other issue other than that when it does not seem like the metrics back that up man let me let me let me jump in here real just hold that thought james real just real sure, quick sure 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 uh, first off i i have a real problem with the term happiness okay not because i'm some sort of unhappy guy right i think that the idea of happiness is sort of the car as the carrot that we use for to, to get the, the donkey to pull the cart. OK, um, the idea of a sustainable, maintainable uh, type of happiness uh, r really relies on this idea that you can in some way have some sort of maintainable long term 
uh, contentment in your life. And uh, I think that the the ability to measure that, you know, satisfaction, happiness, a, a lot of that is is really kind of loose, rough science these days, because uh, if you look at any of the studies, like, say, by uh, like Rob Henderson or you look at uh, stuff, even Dr. David Buss, for that matter, um, happiness is a proximate goal. It is not an ultimate goal. It is something that you're feeling while you're in the moment doing something. So you could ask people to self-report what their their state of happiness is at any particular time. And if their dog do- just died, they're probably going to say that they're pretty unhappy with their lives at that point. So uh, I think that using happiness as sort of this, this metric by which we're going to say uh, marriage is this or marriage is that, I think we got to remember just, I mean, I'm not saying it's like, it's not something we ought to consider, but I'm also saying we, we should also consider the fact that the way we consider or we think of happiness right now in in a long-term state in a maintainable state is not really something i think that we is 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 a is something that is a metric for whether or not marriage ought to be this or no fault divorce does that the other question i had for you andrew as well is that uh when you're quoting these mexican studies from i i presume from mexico these aren't mexicans that are actually in the united states am i clear on that these are. This is actually from the country Mexico. Yes, funny, yes. these are the Abby. metrics. Mexicans so the metrics. Here so we have. So we have. Uh, okay. Not only that, but we have the Canadian study, which also shows uh, uh, Ryan, that, no fault, that when no fault divorce <laughs> is introduced in Canada, it's the same exact thing. You see this kind of radical. Do you, okay, uh, let me ask just some particulars here. What year was no fault divorce instituted in Mexico? It looks like, according to the study, it was 2008 to 2016. Okay, so this is long. This is long after hormonal birth control was a thing in in Mexico. Right, Mexico. Well, we have, well, no, you're missing. You're missing. You're missing the point of what used to be called a Mexican divorce. So, Andrews, that that's not correct. That that, well, that hold, hold that, that thought. Hold that thought, James. Put that. Yeah. In, write that down in your notes there for a second. There's two kinds of no fault divorce. There's unilateral no fault divorce, and then there's the statutory no fault, which means you well, don't have to allege exactly. grounds. Unilateral no He's fault right. was what there Mexico is. had for ages. Well, thank you, Andrew. Let me, let me, let me joke. My law degree is worth real something. Quick. Hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Glenn, you get your time already. <laughs> um, hmm. The other thing I wanted to point out is this, is when I was showing you guys this, uh, where's it? Where's that statistic there? I'll call this up again. Do you when know, Rolo, with statistics. Oh. Go ahead. Nope. Go ahead By the statistics, every human being on earth has one testicle. Fun fact. <laughs> true, true, true story. Yeah. Uh, divorce rate and oral contraceptive use. Now, again, this is CDC uh, and Census Bureau uh, data like overlaid on top of each other here. This is correlative. I'm not saying it's causation. OK, I know I know the difference. Yeah, correlation is not causation. Got it. But that's one hell of a correlation. <laughs> so so okay. I don't I actually the reason that I looked into this at all. And you are right here is because I did find it to be a compelling argument. The first time I've actually really heard a compelling argument uh, and push back towards my worldview on this because it is a really strong correlative. And I don't believe that it has nothing to do with it. I'm just saying I don't think that it's the strongest correlative that we have. If we look at the data from the other nations, which came far after contraception was introduced, and we still see these kind of rampant rises in the rates of divorce, I find that to be a much more compelling correlative. That's my only point. Okay. Well, now, I do think you'd, it's good data, and I never even had considered it until you brought it up. Well, uh, my, my other, my other. I think you're. I still think you're shooting the wrong target with all well, due respect. Other, because other, well, I mean, the idea, the idea it. of remaining married, okay, I don't think is anybody's goal. Like, like, look, there are better arguments, Andrew, for the preposition you're making. Like, the better argument is is that there was studies. I think it was 2021. I can look it up if you want. That, that there was there there was a long term study that essentially found that unhappily married adults were no happier than than divorced adults, meaning that that in terms of satisfaction in life, that 12 separate measures of psychological well-being and it was like depression, self-esteem. They did all of these specific metrics and they said that people who were divorced and people who were unhappily married were actually both the same, that there was no change. What about in their terms kids, though? That. Okay, well, I, let, hold, hold that uh, well, actually, wait a second. There's a great book, longest term study ever done on that called The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. And what it talks about is that parental conflict is bad for children, not divorce. There is a high correlation between parental conflict and divorce. No kidding. But the reality is, is that unhappily married people with a lot of conflict in the marriage have the same levels of toxicity in terms of the effect that it has on their children they don't. as divorced people. That's not true. They, okay, again, 
longest term study ever done Show unexpected legacy of divorce uh, it's a whole book andrew it's not something you can just pull up on a pdf the unexpected legacy well, I mean, of divorce the book has look it up and read for it for it studies i'm guessing right, right. right. yes so, so go ahead and read the whole up, book I, i'm not going to read it to you james james hold up a sec uh, mike go ahead yeah so uh, if i was going to say this because like, i don't think either one of you are making like arguing out of bad faith or anything what i think is you could both cite studies that are in reality but I think there's two things here that have a weight. And for Andrew, I think the weight of the children and them growing up in a two, uh, two person household, I'm just going to say that has a certain weight to it. And that outweighs whatever being happy in the relationship is, or in his estimation, there's a way to become happy through counseling, et cetera, et cetera, or, you know, just shut the fuck up and deal with it and just be unhappy as long as the uh, uh, family stays together. Then uh, I think because I've heard you talk about this before, James, is that there's a certain weight to actually being happy in a relationship and in correlation to uh, the children and their well-being. Your uh, argument is maybe being happy in a relationship weighs more or being unhappy in the relationship also can be toxic to the children. What I'm saying is both. I, it's just how much do you put a weight on each one of these things? And it feels like Andrew puts more of the weight on the children and uh, James puts more of the weight on the uh, on the happiness in the relationship. Is that close? Because I don't think either one of you are like being illogical here. It's just a, but a I, function but, of preference but, here on but, those two points. But Mr. Sartain, I think that that is the crux of the argument. So no, that's the, what, that's the, what the I'm argument, saying. well, I think that the the what you guys refer to as the trad cons make such poor arguments on this is because they don't grant that what you're saying is true. And I do. I do grant that what you're saying is true because when I look at it, it does seem that the metrics that you cite are true metrics and are highly problematic. But what I'm looking at is this gap, which is occurring globally between 18 to 30 year olds. We have a demonstrably low birth rate and it's on the decline like you can't even imagine to the point where we're going to be under the replacement threshold. Uh, you know, even even we already are. I'm not even talking about the replacement Andrew. threshold for yeah, two people. Are. I'm talking about the replacement threshold for one person. That's yeah. where we're heading soon. If you don't have the 18 to 30s, they subsidize the generation before and they subsidize the five generations after or four generations after, depending on you know what area you're living in. But we could easily end up with a seven generation uh, West soon, seven living generations. If we don't have this, you're going to end up like Japan. You're going to end up like China. You're going to end up like South Korea, where they can't take care of their elderly and they can't take care of their youth either because the 18 to 30 year olds subsidize the entire planet. This so is a me, uh, this me, is, me, I'm almost me, done. Uh, One second. Okay, I'm just swear, almost done. This is a catastrophe of magnitude of which you can't even fathom if you see population collapse like this. So I think the most important metric to look at is not your own material happiness. I think that, that you should be looking at the best material state and the best spiritual state for children to be successful in the world. That's that's the crux of my argument. All right, let me throw this out here real quickly just before we start, because I don't think a lot of like conservatives really understand the fertility slump here. And maybe this speaks a little bit more to your point about like no fault divorce and maybe backs up my, uh, my claim about hormonal birth control. And I'm not saying that maybe it's a combination of the two. Okay. Cause I'm not saying it's one of the, it has to be one or the other, sure. but this is the fertility slump that you're referring to right here. And re look where it starts right around 1965 when hormonal birth control was introduced in the United States. It actually starts in the year 1800. Well, okay. <laughs> and it goes like this. Yeah. So we see this, we see this decline, we see this with this boost. And now, now from the last, let's just say 60 some odd years, now we've got this, we've been below replacement level since what, 1972, 1973, yep. the time to be having this conversation and being worried about, I mean, I know that's kind of neither here nor there at this point, but the, the fertility rate has been below replacement level for quite some time right now. And again, at the time when, if you look at that precipitous drop right there, that's right after hormonal birth control and of course uh no fault divorce yeah. which if i'm going to make a, a, a play here i'm going to say that no fault divorce is a is a, a fallout it is a downstream effect of hormonal birth control so go ahead mike what are you gonna say oh yeah so just to add a little bit of context because what andrew said is true uh, the thing is prior to the year 1850 over half the earth's population died before the age of five so having a high birth rate was a function of survival birth rate does not equal survival rate uh, and the second part was up until like 1929 or the Dust Bowl, actually, or let's just say go up to the 1950s, you needed large families in order to survive. So like not all those people were surviving. So that yeah. those numbers don't quite, uh, especially once you have the advent of uh, broad spectrum antibiotics in like 1937, those you need fewer children to maintain your children, if that makes sense.
Yeah. Where the, before, gentleman, before. The, the gentleman from Ontario now has the floor. <laughs> yeah. It's, the problem with stats, and I get the whole thing here, we can do the stats back and forth. It's like I was saying earlier, statistically, every human on being on Earth has one testicle, right? So assuming they're done I correctly. Did the, I did the math. That is correct. Yeah. Assuming they're done correctly, which they usually aren't. Assuming they're looking at the right variables, which they probably aren't. And assuming they give you something you can do about it, which they absolutely cannot. It's just an aggregate number, right? There's a meaning behind it. And you guys can argue whatever. The only thing I know is right now, today, I can not trust any egghead, any authority that says anything because they're always wrong. All you can trust is what you can see with your eyes. So yeah, children being happy, children being raised well, that could probably work. What do you have to do about it? You have to, you know, enforce boundaries, make make your group as happy as possible because happy parents don't fuck up their kids. Mm -hmm. So it's like first principles. You got to stick back to what you can see here. And there's too many variables to even account for all this stuff. So as far as the immigration birth record, that argument was settled in the 1980s. Right now, our plan is unrestricted immigration to hopefully beat out China, India, and Africa on an attrition scale. So. Yeah, but to your point there on with. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Last, this is one I actually wanted to ask you at the end, Andrew. Mm hmm. We remove no fault divorce tomorrow. Like yeah. if, or if we add it at fault divorce, sorry. Yeah. Do you think those people are going to be any better off when they're forced by the state to stay together? Knowing that after 2020, most people realize state enforcing their will on you is not necessarily a good thing. I can't. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to be way better off. So that was, I, the, I lost <laughs> a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of, uh, lucrative aspects of my practice when New York well, went yeah, no and, that's, and that's my point because, because we used to do, we violence. used to do fault trials and fault trials burned the first 10 to $20,000 of the couple's money. So what we would do is we'd put one on the stand and we would say, you know, what happened in the mirror? Oh, he was so mean to me and he made me so upset. Here's the thing. Like, look, I, I think we can go statistics all day long. And I think Andrew and I will both find things that support our respective positions. That's what's great when you're a trial lawyer is like cigarette companies found, you know, doctors who would testify to the fact that cigarettes were good for you. You pay enough, you can find statistics that back things up. It's a really easy thing to do. I think what we fundamentally should be looking at here is why are marriages failing at an alarming rate. And to say it's because people can get divorced slightly easier and slightly cheaper, I, I think that's just ridiculous. And See, I, I would think argue you have to have a PhD. People don't know how to socialize together long term. Well, that's the argument I, I think should be, and I, I thought I heard Andrew say it yesterday, and it was the most compelling thing he said from my perspective was that we need to figure out how to build communities that support marriage. You know, how can men support men in staying married, staying fidelitous, staying focused? Now, Andrew, from what I understood, was saying that that is in some ways tied to religion and that religious communities help people understand their gender roles, the responsibilities of them, help them figure out what it is that is expected of them as a husband or as a wife, help them have definition, help them have support, multi-generational support. So why did they stop doing that 50 years ago? I, well, I think there's a lot of other reasons why people rebelled against religion. But the question is, is this too far south north? Do we treat dandruff with decapitation? That's the conversation we should be having. I, I really just don't think this is my problem with Matt Walsh. My problem with Matt Walsh was not that Matt Walsh has six kids and says being married is phenomenal for him. That's great. And, and even if he says, hey, young people, young men, be married. Don't run around chasing skirt and having a, you know, instead focus on building yourself and building a family. Listen, these are worthwhile sentiments. And I can't say he's wrong or right. I, I don't know. But, but what I can say without question is no fault divorce is not the reason why people are getting divorced more than they used to. Even if you show a slight uptick after you pass no fault statutes in large part because they streamlined the process so all the backlog of divorces finally got put through. It's yeah. not about that. This is this is about why do people hate being married so much these days? Why do people not want to get married these days? This is the question that matters, not no fault divorce. Like, believe me, pass no, get rid of no fault divorce. We'll go back to divorce lawyers. We'll go back to making more money. We'll be happy to do it. But it it, it is not going to solve the problem you're trying to solve.
I got a, I got really quickly here. De, uh, decline birth rates is consistent across all countries right now. Yeah. Even the Africa, ones that, I think is the only uh, exception. Even the ones that don't have no fault divorce. So as far as the fertility slump uh, across the board, across you know globally speaking, right now, you can't really make that can that connection in a worldwide sense because you're still looking at like you know, at countries that don't even consider no fault divorce. Well, so, and Rolo, you know well, what it well, caused but, by female prosperity. That's the single year exactly. reason that drops the birth rate. <laughs> More or less, yeah. So well, the only argument if you want to raise the birth rate is basically right. have to make women barefoot and in the kitchen by law, which yeah, so nobody's going to go for that. Well, go industrialization, yeah. industrialization yeah. is a big prime cause of birth rate drops across the board and has been for a long time. As uh, people become more educated, they most certainly do much more in the way of family planning, this type of thing. However, you will find that the rates, the birth rates themselves, are far better with people who are more religious. So the more religious a person reports being, the more children they're likely to have, meaning that people who don't agree with the religious seem to be thinking themselves right out of existence. And kind of back to our lawyer friend's, um, you know, kind of uh, kind of argument here, I think that this is ground, it, th this is ground zero, as it were. So I, I do think that foundationally, we should have that, that conversation about no fault divorce, but we should also have a foundational talk past that into community building, like you're talking about how, how the religious would come into that. I want to have the conversation for all those things, but I do need you to note this one important thing. If you had a modern battle, like two, two squads fighting with each other, and it was 20% of them died. That would be considered a fucking bloodbath, a bloodbath of spectacular proportions. You're talking about an increase in some of these places, a 30%, 35%, and you're like, it's a slight uptick. That seems kind of disingenuous, dude. Just to be honest with you, it seems kind of disingenuous. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where you're getting those numbers from, but again, it, it seems to be your, your your favorite way of addressing things is to sort of throw out numbers with absolutely no um, uh, actual specific reference. But I I, I, I hear you. Um, I, I guess what I would I say that again, I, I okay, you that's nice. I, I I have a pony in front of me. It's just out of camera. Like I, I yeah, I, I'd love to see it. I, I can't. And again, but 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 okay. here's the thing. I think fundamentally, for example, what you just said about how educated people are less likely to reproduce is that essentially one of the statistics you were just citing that's correct well, we just we okay well educated people are less likely to divorce so what do we do with that how do well, we tie those two statistics together should so we use that to suggest the possibility that um you know that, that, that like what you're doing is you're just taking statistical concepts and numbers and trying to put them together in ways that just respectfully they don't fit and they don't match the preposition you're do. trying to create These are you're, you're trying breakers. to suggest that the instance of people having an entered judgment of divorce means that there are unhappier families as a function of no-fault divorce that that just this is just means that people have finalized a divorce. Do you know how many people are living separate and apart under a written stipulation of settlement as if they were divorced? We used to jokingly call it an Irish divorce. You go out for milk and you never come home. That is what people would do when we were fault based because there were so many barriers. It wasn't that they went. But they did it oh, way less. Oh shit! I'm but just. They did I'm it way less. Andrew, is the I point. didn't. I, respectfully, I didn't interrupt you once when you've been speaking. Not I have once. to, or I can't get a word in, dude. Just to be fair, like I'm trying to be fair Listen, with you, Andrew. I, I being fair would be to be quiet <laughs> Sorry, while the grown ups are talking, and then I'm so quiet when you're fair, talking. You and I didn't say. That's the, that's I the didn't thing? say. <laughs> Thanks, I didn't say a word while you were talking, man. <laughs> right. and, and and Glenn's got. That's because I talk the... in these little segments, and you talk right. in these big. Segments. Well, that's because you're talking in little segments that don't make any sense. You throw grenades of stupidity out, Glenn and then go. The when I start speaking, you just jump in and, and and interrupt every time I'm trying to make a point. So for yeah. someone who seems to value debate so much, you don't seem to follow the rules of it very closely. Hey, hold on, we're, real quick, real quick, Glenn, you had something to say. Go ahead. Finally. Yeah, so <laughs> my question to Andrew is like. Look, I get what you're saying, but the the answer cannot the answer right now is not the church or the way the church does marriage because Christians have a 25 percent divorce rate as well. So they're not they're not doing significantly better than anybody else. They may be having more kids, but they're still just as bad in divorce or make, maintaining a marriage as everybody else is. So that can't be that that's not the solution for this right now. 
So, so what is so let me solution? address so let me address that because it's it's actually not true. So inside of the United States, when people are asked what type of religion they follow, right, as a as a form of average, they almost always will respond that they're Christians as a self identifier. But if you dig into the data a little bit more, especially from Pew Research, Pew Research has been great about this. They identify people by how often they go to church, how how much they participate in the religious activities versus people who just self ID and don't. And you will find that the people who actually participate in the religion and don't just self ID as being that religion, the metrics are far better, less rates of divorce less rates of uh, addiction problems for children. The children do better, the parents do better. They actually make more money. Almost every single metric they do better in. So just, it's, it's, so it's kind like, of- so What not, actions do they the take fake. that are so different than, than the heathens? But that's what I'm saying. What I'm getting Can, into, so, uh, so what they look like at- saying They're not real Christians? Yeah, I'm just saying it's a self ID. It's, it's no different than when a man says he's a woman. It's just a self ID. There's no truth to it. Yeah, look, I, I think Andrew, you know, when we disagree, we disagree loudly. But when we agree, I think we, we agree. And he's absolutely correct. I mean, it, people who identify as Christian, they're essentially saying, yeah, I'm Christian like I'm Caucasian. You know, like I'm, I'm German by ethnicity. But, but am I German from Germany? Do I have any German, you know, do I do any rituals or anything in my family that has anything to do with that? So, yeah, there are plenty of people that identify as Christian. But what, what the statistics reflect and, and what reality, again, common sense, let's get away just from statistics because it's easy to lie with statistics. What, what, it's not hard to figure. You don't need to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Christians, practicing Christians who belong to a church, belong to a faith community where there's a group of people who are dealing with similar struggles in life. They have the support of other people in that community. It, you know, The children are raised together with similar values. Yeah, of course, those people are going to have a stronger bond with each other, with their community. When they have problems, they're going to be more likely to have a support system to talk to. Like This is not rocket science, but it doesn't get back to the fundamental problem, which again, most people aren't in that situation. And, well, and can the, I ask James right. a question here when he's done? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You're in. You're in. So here's my question to you. How come everybody is absolving responsibility from the husband and the wife? You notice this? It's always the community. It's always the law. It's the culture. It's everything else. Why has there not been any discussion at all in this thing about what does a man do that causes it makes divorce more likely? Because or makes only the religious. And what does the woman do? I'll tell you makes why. It more likely? It's because only the religious can make ought prescriptions that make sense. That's why. No, so, I'm talking practical. I'm like, and, does and he do the I dishes? I am talking she, in a practical sense, right? Yeah, does so she lose secular, weight? That's the stuff. Secular morality has no argument to enforce the morals of uh, any sexuality whatsoever, uh, let alone marriage or any union thereof. Secular morality can't do it. So if you're you're asking these questions like, um, you know, why is it that these people are absolved of responsibility? It's because society has no choice but to absolve them because there's no foundational ethics that require them to stay together. Only the religion can bring that. Nothing else can. Yeah, I'm not talking morals. I think, wait, but I, I think if you I'm tie talking that practical things. If you tie that back, though, no one's taking away individual responsibility here. I, I, I understand your your question, Ryan, and I think it's a it's an interesting point. But look, even if you didn't believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you join a church, okay, and you become an active participant in that church community you're going to be built up. You're gonna have people around you that care about you. You're gonna have multi-generational influence. You're gonna have older men who are gonna to say to you, yeah, I had problems in my marriage when I was at your age, and I and know what, what that's going through. And what did they do through. about it? Exactly, but, they swap but, notes. But, right, but, but again, this is about, you can't take, we, we are social creatures. You can't remove us from that context completely and say, well, what is it after, where's the individual responsibility? Sure, the individual responsibility is absolutely important, but the individual is part of a culture, part of a society. How our self-perception is defined is very much a function of who's to the left of us and who's to the right of us. But this kind of moves to my point, which is to say emphatically that these sorts of odds, these kind of ethical foundations, which these communities are built around around so culture is downwind of theology and politics is downwind of culture this is how all societies in human history have always worked the same thing you see on a micro scale as you do on a macro scale so on the micro these communities you're talking about where you have cross-generational support systems and things like this it's because their grounding foundational glued ethics are there 
Whereas you don't see this with secular identity. It's a massive problem and nobody really wants to talk about it. I have no idea why it seems. Right. Well, yeah. So can I ask Andrew, can I ask Andrew, can I ask Andrew a question though? Hold that, hold that. I'd like to, I'd like hold Andrew's that, answer thought, to a question. Hold yeah. that, hold that thought ahead. just real quickly. Um, I, I, this was actually really very timely. Thank you, Alvin. Gallup, I was going to pull this up. You, you beat me to it. Uh, Gallup polled uh, 2017, very religious Americans consider divorce as morally acceptable. Yeah. So now um, I, I understand this is going to be like, oh, well, not in my church. I, I get it. We're, we can get to no true Scott. Nothing like, like that. Nothing like that. However, let me let me one more thing is also if we're going to talk about like, you know, uh, religious people tend to stay married, whatever, whatever your religious affiliation happens to be there. Are, what, do, what do you think the highest, uh, let's see, stated identified religion is in prison right now? <laughs> so Christianity, Christianity. Exactly. So we can say, well, more criminals are Christian uh, than any other religion in the world. Right. They so at least identify that. Way. But how you are like how they identify correct but mm -hmm. we can i can i can i can say that and give you that statistic by saying more criminals are christian and therefore more christians are criminals if you if you understand what i'm saying so sure. as far as the identification side is is, is concerned no it, it just depends on how you're going to serve that up but the other part of this is and then the last thing i want to get to is that uh when i was writing my fourth book on religion uh, I, I made a, I did a quote in there, and I think I, back at the time, it might be more now, but at the time, it was 68% of Christian identifying Christians admitted to having a problem or an addiction with pornography as well. So uh, as far as like the church is concerned, and we're also, we're, when we say the church, are we talking about Catholicism? Are we talking about Mormons? Are we talking about, you know, That's Protestants? That's also a good question. Baptists? Are we talking about you know, Methodists? There's, which franchise are we really talking about in, in terms of, of you know who does better than what what demographic is better than what demographic and clearly we can the hindus seem to have got something right but maybe that's a statistical anomaly well, they take out the so human happiness about, they just go strictly um, the time when yeah. you're talking about the like the gallup poll that you cited yeah uh, christians don't say that uh divorce except catholics they do this but uh, oh, no other denomination says that divorce itself is an immoral proposition but that there's moral ways in which it should be done. It ought be done. So, for instance, if there's uh, significant domestic abuse, if there's addiction and if there's abandonment, all of those would be more it would then be a moral prescription to allow divorce. So there's no there's no real conflict there with the very religious saying that uh, divorce is morally permissible because it is. It's the circumstances of which it's morally permissible under. But see, that's not what the Bible says, right? The Bible says you're only allowed to divorce whether if it's uh, sexual immorality and if you are unequally yoked and your spouse chooses to leave you, then you're free from that bond. So then so, it I is mean, giving you moral prescriptions for the ought. So it is saying you can have divorces yes, under certain under, moral under criteria. Very, under, Here's very, the problem. Two, two we, we, we think in generalities and we live in details. So when mm. you say, for example, significant domestic violence, you do realize how thorny of a ground that is, right? But what is significant domestic violence? How is it defined? Each state defines it differently. So, you know, these are, the, these are very easy things to throw out there in terms of the statement of, well, if there is significant domestic violence, but the, the manner in which significant domestic violence is, is defined, the manner in which it is proven, because again, as a lawyer, it doesn't matter what I know, it matters what I can prove in a court of law, and most people, if you're not aware of it, don't abuse their spouses physically in the presence of other people. They do it in the privacy of their own home. So there's not a lot of evidence. Most victims of intimate partner violence don't call the police. They don't file police reports. So there's problems with that concept. But, but I, I want to pivot because, again, I want to stay focused on single concepts and topics. And one of the things that Andrew was talking about earlier was this idea that I, I guess what, if I understand your point correctly, is you're saying that by creating no, getting rid of no fault and making it harder, like barriers to exiting a marriage, that it will give people time to um, work on their marriage and realize whether or not they actually want to get divorced. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, there, there becomes barriers for exit. So it okay. used to be a prescription as well uh, right. for show cause even that you had to get counseling, you had to do things like this. This yes. is an important aspect of being able to exit the marriage. Right, okay. So so that's what's referred to legally as a cooling period, right? You, you're, you're aware that there are still seven states that require a cooling period in the United States. Yeah, I'm sure and there a are. Cooling yeah, there's seven states that require a cooling period, uh, six months to a year. Okay, mm -hmm. Massachusetts requires a year. I think I forget what the other states are, like Montana, Vermont. There's a few others that it's six months is a cooling period. So under your theory, right, a cooling period would 
would likely lead to or would increase the likelihood of people not getting divorced at the end of the cooling period. Is that right? Well, that would depend. There might be some other variables which are in there. But if we're looking at this as a whole, what I would say to you kind of specifically is if you have no cause, there would be no cooling period to begin with. You would have to actually engage in that marriage like you used to. You brought up unilateral marriages, for instance, which I thought was great. Unilateral divorces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Unilateral divorces. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was kind of a great thing to bring up because we do have a lot of comparative data and the Horowitz study really narrows in on the unilateral divorce versus the no fault. And you definitely see a significant increase in the divorces and not just due to backlogs. It's not just due to the backlogs. I know that that's kind of uh, something which is thrown out a lot, but uh, definitely when you're looking at what you call a cooling off period, I think that now that's adjusted for culture. But if you could move backwards and kind of look at the data backwards and say, wait a second, there needs to be some kind of cause for you to even enter into a cool off period. That's kind of the grounding that I'm looking at. Wait, I'm sorry. So under your theory of what this would look like. Well, I'm just before you could even theory. okay. Well, no, I'm, I'm asking you like you get to make the rule now, Andrew, and you're in charge of society. Okay? okay, when it comes to this issue. Yeah. And what you're saying is before you can even separate and have a cooling off period. Yep. The state would have the authority to deny you the right to do that. Well, no, the church would. So as far as the secular, church would. Yeah, okay. So as well, far as the secular right. marriage. I was talking, though, about mm -hmm. the United States. So, yeah, but even in the United States, uh, the church often had dominion over marriage. This is a, so we're going to give the church dominion over secular marriage. Or is this where we're getting Not back to what we talked marriage. about? Yeah. No, okay. No. So what? So again, we're talking about two completely different things. We're You're not talking about I can give you a secular prescription covenant and marriage versus legal marriage. Yeah. Well, well, if, if yeah. you're saying that the church should be in control of when people can separate from each other physically to begin a cooling period or a separation or file for divorce, yeah. you're putting the church in state place, right? So yeah, yeah. again, so I'm not respond. saying that so I can answer okay. your question. Okay. For secular marriage, my prescription is that secularists should not get married because they have no justification to do so ever. None, zero, nilch. So there shouldn't be marriage for secularists. I don't know what the hell they want to call it or how they would put it together, but they have zero justification to get married. Marriage is a religious sacrament. It's a religious institution. So when I make ought claims, I'm making it towards the claim of the church should be governing these things because these are religious sacraments. Secularists should not be governing them. Secular, why the hell would a secularist get married? I can't think of a single moral justification secularists would have for marriage. Whatever commitment they decide to make with each other, whatever vows, they don't need the state for any of that. I, I have no idea why they do it. It makes no sense. The church do it well, tomorrow, but, but here's the problem. Way. Here's the problem, Andrew, though. Before we get Take into sort of the, the, girl. That's what before we get into the idea, <laughs> Michael, Michael's just like, keep, keep away from my wife. Uh, I got a question I, for my fucking woman. Hey, but I, Andrew, I guess my right question here? is, yeah, again, I appreciate this as an answer from the from the point of view of philosophically, what kind of society should we be building? building. I, I understand you have the right to have your perspective on that. W but the world we currently live in, there are a tremendous number of people that have engaged in this, what you would consider to be utterly useless concept of a secular legal marriage. And my job, you know, my day job is helping them untie that knot. So I, I, we can't wave a wand and have them be in a society where they didn't get married. They're already married. So I, I'm, I'm simply trying to understand what do we do with those people when when one or both of them decide we no longer wish to be in the legal status of marriage which is a status conferred by the state currently well, not by the church to, what you'd have to do is the same thing you would do if you removed any law process so you'd have what would be called a grandfathered clause or something like this you would still have to process out all of the divorcees and uh, and that type of thing but i think that the state itself should probably absent itself from marriage completely for good always because there's no point to it 
the if they were going to be involved in marriage, the only good <laughs> the only good justification for the state to be involved would be for the promotion of the family unit for the purpose of raising up birth rates and for the purpose of kind of the health and welfare of the United States. But as we've seen, this is counterintuitive to the health and welfare of the United States for secularists. They are not healthier when they're married. They're not doing better when they're married. To some degree, maybe you could make the argument they do by minor metrics, but they're not doing well under marriage. Secular marriage is not going very well for secularists. I have no idea why the hell they're doing it. Like, what's the point? Oh, I, got a, I got a question. Well, you, keep, you keep skipping man. over, though, Andrew. We talked about it yesterday. You keep skipping me. over the legal. I mean, that there is, in fact, currently, currently, I'm not yeah. saying there should be, but currently, yeah. there are a tremendous number of very specific benefits legally to marrying tax benefits, mm -hmm. an array of financial benefits. There, I mean, there, there, there's a reason why that, that is. That is. True. And that yeah. is true. However, it's also true that we can reform those laws 100%. for, co for cohabitation yes. and but, things but like again, this. Again, now we're talking. It yeah. currently exists. Mm -hmm. I, as I, this. I agree that so, yeah. the descriptive I, is is true, I but I'm giving an ought on really top like, of the descriptive I gotta, is. I get your point. That's okay. So here's what I'm going to ask you real quickly. So I'm, I'm just for my own clarification. I got a question for Mike. Where I have a follow up for this as, as well. Uh, so let me let me see if I get this straight. And Andrew, so you're what you're saying is that the people who aren't religious shouldn't have the rights to get married. Is that which is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or, OK, so but you're also promoting marriage, just not for secular people. That's right. So secular people should never get married. Then if that's the case, then what about the birth rate? So the birth rate is not going to be a problem either, because if so, you look at the data, you just should repopulate the if world. If you so look at the data, yeah. you'll find that it's mostly the religious who are doing the repopulating now. Okay. And you'll find that it'll be the religious in the future as this trend continues that will be doing most of the repopulation in the future, too. So in why fact, the I would say this is the best prescription for the birth rate. Uh, so so that, why doesn't the church do this, though? They could do it tomorrow if they wanted to. 2050, correct? They are advocating for this. However, you have to Who understand. Who are they advocating to? They ought to have to understand that this is big business, right? Divorce is big business. Marriage is big business. And I mean, there, there's an entire yeah, industry. Yeah, government stuff, though. There's, there's an entire industry which is built around this. We're okay. in the beginning stages of an advocation process for this at all. Uh, this has not been something which has been on the table in my lifetime. And suddenly through the conversations which I've been able to have with Red Pillars and other people such as yourself, we're able to see, hey, they have great descriptors for the problem, but they don't really have great uh, pushes for solutions. And when I look at uh, an advocacy system, I do want to see oughts made. And I do think we ought to do that. Go ahead, right, go Honestly, ahead. I'm I'm not even against it. You guys want the church to do your own thing. You could do it tomorrow, but they don't. I don't know why. And you're saying it's no, because there's they regulations just don't know yet. around it. You can't just go to a church and there's get Muslims married and Jewish people and doing that right recognized. now. They have their own police yeah, force. Yeah, but it's not recognized. That's the problem. Who does and it need to be other than God and the church? The who has to recognize it? The though? state does need to recognize why? religious marriage. Do they? Why? Yeah, that's that's true. What happens if they don't? Because you become a bigamist if you don't. Obviously, the state is going to have to recognize. They have to recognize it. OK, yeah, so we're basically arguing wise. you just want to be like the EPA for marriage for the state anyway. So it's like whatever. <laughs> so if I live but on here's a, the point, though, no, here's the part that gets me is like, I get it. Get married, but it's like, is that, is that legit? Because it was a religious marriage. I'm just not. Doing well, and this whole thing's just an issue of incentives, right? Hmm. So you want everybody. I mean, I would assume you want everybody to help you push forward this grand narrative and plan. And yeah. what incentive is there for us? Because it's not going to save us. It's yeah, going it to save your you. children. It will no, by the time you. this so gets implemented, now, I'll be dead. Even the red pillars now. Well, th that's the thing. This is the problem with kind of hedonism uh, in general. Is it's not hedonism. It's, it's practical. Like it's incentives. me, 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 materialism. I'm not looking for me, 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 me. I'm looking for when I'm dead, what happens with my children and their children mm -hmm. and their children. And the legacy that I leave behind, I think, is super important for future generations. So whether or not it benefits you right this second. Uh, it doesn't. Oh, I didn't say right this you. second. Like it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't hurt you at all, right? Yeah, not even I'm not a against bit. it. Yeah. Never. So I think. So I think pushing towards it. If you want to see a really good, healthy society, the healthiest possible society you can see would be a society which operates under a high moral framework, which would include the religious and their uh, institution of marriage being valid and uh, something which other people gravitate towards if they want that type of union. Otherwise, there's no moral justification for secularists to do it at all. They just do it. I don't even know why the hell they do it. It makes no sense. Oh, I'm, I'm with you on that one. But that's the point, right? It's you have to think about incentives. Without incentives, nothing happens. People get married because guys want to get laid and girls like comfort. Ultimately, if you get down to it. So there's and then like people want to stay together. What makes people stay together? It's not the laws. It's not because 
you know, Sky Jesus will get mad at you. It's because ultimately a girl and a guy are getting what they want from a relationship. In that case, you know, children, sex. They don't need marriage for any of that. Stability. You don't, you don't. That's exactly my point. But you want the marriage for that. So this is like a parallel track. If you want to do, have the church repopulate the earth, do all that stuff. There are currently two societies which exist. There's two societies which exist. There's a secular society. So why is the one that isn't even against? So, and I I know I'm asking you to defend Matt Walsh, which is incomprehensibly impossible, but. (laughs) So why is easier shitting on the guys who are running on their parallel track? We're trying trying to figure out what's the best way to do with what we got now. Yeah, I, can't, I don't think I don't think Matt behalf, Walsh. Yeah. Look, I don't think Matt Walsh is saying. I that, can't speak that, on his behalf anyway. Uh, Matt Walsh would have to speak on his own I, behalf. I, I, I'm, I'm only I, advocating. I I'm only advocating for what I think most of my side would agree with, and what yeah. most of my side does believe uh, institutionally is correct. And I don't think that we have this huge conflict with the red pillars, uh, like is being portrayed. I think that Rollo makes a great point when he says this is kind of an artificially. Uh, pushed thing to kind of get the trad cons and the red pillars to be warring with each other. Yet, I don't think any of you guys really have that much problem with my prescriptions here. They seem reasonable and they seem like something we ought to push towards for a healthy me, society. Me, me, well, well, I do, but it, that's beside right the point. It's like, it's I, I think there's a mischaracter. Yeah, there's a mischaracterization happening. I also, and, that, and that is that, that I don't think anybody on the quote unquote red pill side of this is saying that Matt Walsh or Andrew or anyone who is religious, married, wishes to, to, to live their lives in, in that way, honor their relationship in that particular way. Any of us are saying, oh, you're an idiot for doing that. I don't think any, any I've never heard anybody saying you're an idiot for doing that. When, I've whenever, even the most, an idiot, but not because Well, okay, but for different reasons. <laughs> a- anytime, any, you know, I, I don't know, even the most like, you know, tail chasing crazy person, when they see a couple that's happy and married and they're raising children and they're enjoying their life and their children, I don't see them shitting on that. I, I, I think they look at it and go, look at this guy, he won the lottery, good for him, he's happy, that's good for him. It well, what do we learn from happy. Him? Right. But but again, I, I'm tied in. I'm still confused because there are like a, over eleven hundred statutory benefits throughout the 50 states for the legal act of getting married. And and so the religious concept of marriage and why people should bond. Look, we can have a debate. And it's I don't know how productive it'll ever be to have a debate about whether there can be secular morality. You know, the, 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 I think that there is a religious perspective that says, look, if, if, you know, an omnipotent creator deity tells you not to kill people, that that's the reason you shouldn't kill people. I, I'm not sure that, that you need that in order to not kill people. Like I, I rape and kill as many people as I want to which is none because I'm not a piece of shit. <laughs> Thank you. Zero. So it's not because like the, the, you know, I'm going to get to live in Disneyland when I die. I hope I do. That's lovely. Um, I hope I get to see my mom again. I hope I get to listen. I hope, I hope. But the truth is, is I, you know, you live your life. There are people who live their lives in a moral way that are secular. I'm sure no one, I'm sure Andrew wouldn't disagree with that, that there are moral people that are not religious. Um, I, I, not that they shouldn't be saved, not that they shouldn't be, I get it. But I, I, realistically, I'm just still tied into the idea that if we're talking about marriage, it sounds like you're saying it should be much harder. The key point here is it should be much harder to get married is what you're really saying. You're, and you're exit so No fault divorce. I got you on the exit part. We're going to probably agree to disagree in terms of the value of those statistics because, again, the cooling period, look into it. Marital conflict versus divorce and its effect on children, look into it. But, I, I, and again, the, the, it'll speak for itself. And also, I, I think some of this is just logic, like just basic logic. But barriers yeah, me, to entry me, may be the place that, that, that I think we're most tight because the red pill totally and the trad cons, it sounds like yeah. the, 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 the happy place where they both meet is not so many people should be getting married. You should be required to read the that. rational mail in order to get married. That's uh, right. Can yes, we all agree? I put a one in the chat. That's not a bad right. idea, actually. actually. I don't think that's a read bad idea. Rational mail all right. before I, have, you get uh, I, got a qu- I got a quick question here. Okay, so for first and foremost, I think one of the problems that the sort of traditional concern, big con, thank you for that one, uh, Stephen Crowder. I think that the, one of the problems that they have is there's always this conflation between hedonism and individualism. Okay, because to to be thinking about yourself or to putting be putting yourself first or be uh, having uh, what I call enlightened self interest, meaning like I can't help others until I can help myself first. That sounds like hedonism. That sounds like we're just living for our own passions and our pleasures, as opposed to living with a living from a position of authority, having responsibilities, but also having a commensurate authority to affect those responsibilities. 
possibilities. Right now, we do not have that in modern marriage, period, end mm -hmm. of story, because we live in a, a gynocentric social order that leans very heavily towards women in the church, in marriage, in politics, in economics, in education. And in divorce, and, and in and divorce. Well, divorce. So, so to name, clarify. Name um, the field. Hold on, what, what, yeah, one sure. more second here. Go ahead. Uh, the, other, the other thing I was going to say is that um, – so when, when we're talking about that, with the, the difference between, say, hedonism and individualism, I get that because it's, 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 it seems like it's a point of entry. It seems like it's a point of, of attack. Now, the other thing I was going to say is, like, when we have these conflicts, when it comes to, like, oh, don't get married, don't do this, go get a vasectomy, uh, that kind of crap. The, uh, the, the problem that we have with that is like they only see it from that position. Like I go and I argue against like black pill doomers and MGTOWs all the time saying they want to say, oh, repeal the 19th or whatever. Pearl is like, you know, parroting back from the black pill right now. And I always say, great. How are you going to do that? How does that work? Because I will I, I will lock horns with those guys as well, saying I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that women should have the right to vote. I think they should just do it a little bit more, edu be educated voters, of course, or having a. Um, and I think you guys had this conversation before as well as I think that the the ability to vote should be something that is qualified for. They so you have skin in the game. I mean, we could yep. we can get into that as well. But the, the 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 long and the short of it is is like even if that were the case, if somebody was saying, uh, you know, I don't think women should have, should have the right to vote. I think we should be, you know ban abortion. I think we should do all all these other all these other social initiatives. Awesome. Tell me how you're going to do that. What is your once the once the revolution is over? What's your plan for restructuring society? And no one has a goddamn idea or a clue after that. They just want to get involved in. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of money, by the way, in in the propaganda and the agitation. Blaming the other, basically. Exactly. So, and then, anyways. Right, I, but but if we're if we're talking about so divorce, clarify, though, um, Rolo, well, let me just clarify these two things real quick, ahead. and then mm -hmm. then I'll pass it over. So, when I say hedonism, I want you to understand specifically what I mean by this. Uh, so you have the ethics of outcome or the ethics of duty, deontology or consequentialism, often referred to as utilitarianism. Yeah. What I feel like you guys are really focusing on is the consequence portion, right? So the outcomes are what kind of inform what your morality is. So you don't kill people like the gentleman said, because it's it's bad because the outcome is bad, right? That's uh, that would be classified as hedonism. It's not designed to be like a dunk or an own any more than degenerate is. Degenerate just means without morality. That's all that it means. Uh, and when we're talking about without morality, we just mean without the justification for it. So I agree with you that women don't follow their duties. They should be following their marital duties. They have duties. I'm, we look at deontology as our ethical system, not consequentialism, though we do think you get better consequences by following duties. I just wanted to clarify that for you. Yeah, uh, and I, well, I, think, I think that's well said, but I, I'd like to, 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 to bring up a, another topic that I, I think yes. is where our, I should probably be. And, and that is if we look at marriage as essentially husband and wife, okay, we're, we're using husband and wife as a... Uh, agreement as to what their response rights and responsibilities to each other would be right so what they can expect of each other and what their obligations are to each other okay mm -hmm. what what is problematic from my point of view and where a lot of my work falls into the category of is most of the promises that a man makes in a traditional marriage i will support you protect you provide for you economically um, I will ensure that you're fed, sheltered. I will take care of our children from a financial support standpoint. They are enforceable at law, meaning the state can enforce them. They can levy your tax returns. They can levy your earnings. They can put you in jail, take away your driver's or professional license if you fail to pay things. What is the woman bringing to that relationship? Again, in a traditional marriage, she's bringing support. She's bringing emotional support. She's bringing children, right? And raising children, caring for children, providing a nurturing, loving environment for the children, providing love and affection to the husband, providing sex to the husband, okay? Meeting his needs in that way. This is, again, the, the structure, I think we all agree, of a traditional marriage. None of those are state enforceable promises. So two people are signing up for a legal contract where only one side of it is enforceable with the power of the state and the other is not enforceable. So if the minute we get married, she says, I'm not sleeping with you anymore, I'm not being nice to you ever again, and I'm not having kids with you, that is, you can't force her legally to do any of those three things. Well, sounds like they says, shouldn't do that then, huh? <laughs> right, but 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 I hate to say it, Andrew. You're starting to sound like you're saying people shouldn't get married, which is the opposite of the you position. Mean, you mean secularists? 
No, I don't think Shakira should be getting married. Okay, then the, you're saying the majority of people in the United States should not get married. I just want to quote you on that. Andrew Wilson no. is saying to the world today that, that the, the majority of people in the United States should not get married. I don't believe married. that the majority of the people in the United States are secularists. That's absurd. Well, okay, so so you're saying that when they self-identify as Christians, that that means that they're great. Because how many, what's the percentage on Christians? And then what percentage yeah, of that fits looking, your definition of yeah, Christians? But even if you're looking at kind of the heavy percentile distinction here, so the people who are more apt to identify towards Christianity, like I at least make an effort, I make an attempt, I'm trying, I'm doing this, it's still the majority of the population. So they're Christian enough. Yeah, I think that for you, if you're going to make if you're going to make any of these Scottish. kinds of if you're going to make any of these types of vows or any of these types of sacraments or things like that, if it's not in a religious connotation or context, you just made a fantastic argument for why you shouldn't do that. And I don't think I disagree. I agree. That seems like it's a fantastic argument for why secularists nowhere have any justification for marriage whatsoever. And so even when if you it means most, even if that means most, then yes, most probably shouldn't. If there's they're secularist and they're mo moving into a rotten deal for a marriage contract, they have no justification for the marriage to begin with. Then what are what you the hell suggesting? Would they do it for? I'm sorry, though. Are you suggesting that the majority of the United States is, in fact, not secularist? Because I thought one of the fundamental premises that I hear from the trad con side of the table, which I think is correct, is that we've fallen into a sort of moral decay and that the overwhelming majority of society is now coming from a secular worldview and not from a religious so moral it is, worldview. It is true that secularists are mostly in charge of our institutions, especially the educational okay. systems. That's Got true. It. However, yeah. the majority of the population, I don't believe, are secular. I get the distinction. Yep. Yeah, yep. at all. You're saying that they're the, they're the vocal minority, that they're the... They're they're in the media, they're in the, the educational system, and therefore we think that that is the majority. But in fact, that is the 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 people who have the bullhorn is is the secularists. Yeah, that's uh, either correct. way. None of them, yeah. none of them are coming to yeah, say that makes sense. That's true. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't disprove that, and I can't disagree with it. The state could change this tomorrow, and they too. don't. So nobody's coming to save us, and all that's left is incentives. And you can call it hedonistic, but if a guy wants to marry a girl, he has to offer her something emotional security, you know, the alpha traits, the beta traits, whatever you want to say. And the part that gets me about all these conversations is we'll argue about statistics, 10 years of statistics. Not one person mentions, what can you do to incentivize this person? And you're right, James, when you were talking before about, uh, well, she could decide not to fuck you tomorrow and you can't do anything about that. Right. There's no hard power. I can't force her to do it. I can't do pull a Martin Luther and just go fuck the maid. Well, so and if Andrew has incentives. his way, you're not allowed to divorce her either. Yeah, well, well, that's, well, that's, well, I get that. And the stick well, is, not, I would I mean, argue the stick true, is not a but... good solution either. <laughs> well, wait, how's that not true, Andrew? I'm sorry. Which of the, which of the fault the grounds was her refusing so to sleep be, with you? There should. So this is part of your marriage vows. These are part of your marriage vows. If the church is the grantor of who gets married and the grantor of who is divorced, if you go and tell, uh, tell the church, hey, these people are not following what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, the church may very well grant you a divorce for that. That's under a your, very big if, though, Andrew. Yeah, that, under that, your, well, yeah, everything. You started that sentence if. with if well, the church gets to decide who gets married. Back it up a yeah. step. Back it up a step. If Which the is girl's my position. not wanting to do right. her vows or whatever, there's incentives. You can do that. If a guy isn't sleeping with his wife, he can go work out, get in better shape. He can stop seeing hookers and go see her. If she doesn't want to sleep with her man, she can lose weight. She can get off of SSRIs. Like, I'm talking mechanics here. Like, what wrench do you use to change a spark plug kind of stuff? And this is why I hate these conversations. No offense, you guys are great. It's because they ignore these very basic, simple, practical things. As a wife, lose weight. Your husband will find you more desirable and you'll feel more loved. As a husband, don't go sleep with hookers and your wife will not feel betrayed and leave your ass. When you have kids, don't beat them. It's like very practical things. And as guys, you can make the choice to do any of these things outside Listen. of religion, outside of secularism. And we don't have to argue with, well, you shouldn't do You shouldn't. You shouldn't. It's like just it's incentives. Look, you Christianity know? Today loved my book and Focus on the Family just wrote an entire article about my perspective from my soft white underbelly interview. Yeah, and, and then the, 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 my the, book on the Muslim, like, right, because the truth is, is what am I suggesting? But I'm suggesting ways that you can be nicer to your husband, nicer to your wife, small gestures well, that will maintain connection between the two of you. But again, I'd say better, the premise not of, nicer. 
the pre- then fine, that I'll, I'll adopt yeah. your phrasing. What, what <laughs> we're talking about here, though, is two very different concepts of marriage. I'm talking about the one that exists today, and Andrew is talking about one that, that he, he believes tomorrow. we should aspire to and that he thinks would be a more successful model. If I'm we just change the... Yeah, but fundamentally, neither one of them is going to change I'm, men and women. I said I'm fine with talking about both. So I'm fine with making the emphatic statement on many of your is claims. You've noticed I've agreed with many of your is claims. But mm-hmm. what I am for is for a sequence of reforms, ground, mm-hmm. grass zero reforms, so that we can make some sort of attempt to fix this absolutely broken process, this absolutely destroyed process. Yeah. And I think that and that ethics are a huge thing and that duties are a huge thing. And I think that society has forgotten about those. That used to oh, be a pinnacle sure. of so, us. So, and I'll so shut up after so this. So to tie it back, to, though, yeah. to tie right. it back to, to, to the idea that Andrew just posited, which is I was talking about, you know, how, how there are enforceable promises at law and then there are unenforceable promises in a marriage contract. All right, James, hold that so, thought for a second. Or Ryan, you're next. And then Glenn, go. Yeah, so let's say this then. So why is the, and you're the only one who's ever talked about practical ways to get through this. Why is the argument then about the morality and notch counts and not how do we get Christians into the state house? How do we get laws passed? How do we, how do we, like all the practical ways you would get these things question. changed? Yeah, so well, fantastic fantastic nobody talks question. about it. They're just sitting there firing brimstone it. with the clacker on the on the street corner. No, I do talk about it. I actually have solutions for that. That's too. what I mean. Other than you, though, nobody's doing it. No, well, they're not. That's true. Go ahead, Glenn. Glenn, Glenn, you're up. So my question is, okay, Andrew. So let's say the say the church does take over marriage and it does take over divorce, but with the divorce law still in place, how are you going to make it attractive for young men? Because we're not. As you said, you're talking about the future generations. Okay, so we're talking about our son sons. Why would our son's sons want to get married with the church if the state laws are still in place? If the state has to recognize, hold on, let me finish. If the state has to recognize the church's marriages, so then that means the mar- the church would have to also recognize the state's laws on marriage. Well, no, not necessarily. Right? You can always formulate you can formulate law any number of different ways. Uh, our lawyer lawyer friend will tell you that. Um, But anyway, kind of to address this point, try to understand that most people adopt the value structure of their parents. So knowing that this is true, this includes the religious structures as well. Uh, The way that the left and progressives uh, actually recruit people is not by taking their values and putting it onto their children because they're not having children. What they do is they take your children and they put their values into them. What what you've seen is kind of this massive uh, counterculture movement, which has happened around homeschooling not just around homeschooling, but around kind of this traditional value structure of we're going to teach our kids these values. Part of that should be that you instill in them strong duties to move back into these education systems and to move back into these positions of leadership. I think that that's extremely important. This is not something that's going to be done in this generation, and the work's not going to be done in my lifetime. It's going to be a sequence and series of small reforms leading to this the same way the communists infiltrated 100 and 150 years ago they did it incrementally and slowly and then eventually they were able to get their agenda through i feel like we can do the exact same thing we're the ones who have the children we own the future but uh, guys conduct 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 an experiment oh sorry go ahead go ahead mike, uh, yeah, mike has it mike mike did you want to did you want to talk about the the stats that you gave me in the private chat no, no, that's fine. But it was just going back to the secular thing. Yeah, I was under the same impression, but you're right. It's about twenty to twenty nine percent of they're called the nuns. I mean they don't yeah. they don't affiliate with any religion. So yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. So I guess under Andrew's um what Andrew's saying is that then that seventy percent that does have some secular belief, they should be able to populate and the or get married and the rest of them shouldn't. Here's, here's my that, question for you. Here's my question for you, Mike. Mike, I understand what your personal situation is right now with Kylie. So, yeah. and you have on Access Vegas on a couple of times that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not ruling out the fact that I want to be married at some point and I want to have kids yeah. at some point, right? And I know what your situation is with her. Would that be precluded by you guys getting married? Would that change your situation with her? And the reason I'm asking that is because I asked this on yesterday's show on, uh, on uh, Rule Zero about how we do marriage right now, because yeah. I, and I brought up the fact that like Adam 22 and Lena, the plug are technically married. They I've saw, I saw the bridal mm-hmm. shower and the gown and everything like yeah. that. I know that they are quote unquote legally married. Same thing with uh, destiny and, and Melina, they are technically married, but they're in no way, um, 
uh, what we would say traditionally uh, yeah. equally yoked. They're degenerates, man. Degenerates, right? <laughs> so, 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 but, but like, we've had this conversation before, and I think it was with, with Justin Waller or something, where it's like open on your end, closed on her end. Then there's like my situation, which is closed on my end, closed on her end, which is the traditional yeah. way of doing it. And I think that a lot of the uh, sort of the consternation that comes between, you know, like say uh, James and, and Andrew is simply the way that we're doing marriage now. And we're still expecting it to be this old model 20th century. Well, actually, we can go back to, you know, the first century, you know, way of doing of doing marriage. How would you like listening to all this? How do you think that you're like, if let's just say for sake of argument, you pop talk about this all tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Um, Like how would that affect your personal situation? Right. Uh, It's more, it's kind of up to her and what her her proclivities would be as far as that's concerned. I think you need probably need to explain to the rest of the audience. I'm uh, we're polygynous, meaning the two of us see women together sometimes Uh, that would probably change, but it would probably have more to do with the kids than it would do with marriage. So it'd be a practical decision rather than, yeah, it would, it would, it would be, it would be a, yeah, probably be a practical decision. And to be fair, like, you know, I was, we we were joking the other day. I'm like, it, uh, my, my, the guys in my company were in Mexico. Mexico last week they're like do you want to have kids michael and i was like uh kids you mean a future esport athlete and future quarterback <laughs> yes yes i would like to have a future quarterback slash point guard slash linebacker yes absolutely um yeah in those cases i mean that would probably be the focus of my life it is kind of uh time consuming for the the lifestyle that we have uh you know whatever but it's she's just as much into it as i am so it would probably be more of a practical decision rather than like a moral one so, so can I just say, I, I think yeah. everyone should conduct a social experiment, everyone yeah. in the audience who's listening, and that is to, to sort of hear my point and, and what I think the takeaway should be here when it comes to marriage and divorce and why we're having problems as marriage and why mm-hmm. getting out of marriages is really not the challenge. Go, go have two Facebook accounts, have like a fake male one and a fake female one and post as the man I am proud to do my duties as a husband and watch how many fucking men and women are going to give you likes and tell you how amazing you are. Bravo. Yeah. And then go on as a woman and write, I am proud to do my duties as a wife and watch yourself get fucking pilloried by every single woman out there. And a lot of men who are trying to demonstrate how, oh, how dare you? Because again, this is a one-sided deal now, gang. It, you know, all of these, it, that's why, again, when I have trad con people saying to me how marriage is so great, they mean their marriage. They mean a marriage where you've got defined senses of what your respective rights and obligations are, and you're both following them to some degree, and you can point to them. And in some of these relationships, because they're religious, they have a book that tells you, here's what you're supposed to do. So we're in a society now where, and again, I think Andrew and I agree on this, that from a secular standpoint, secular marriage, people that are not religious, people that do not believe that there is any, much less duties, that there's just no objective truth, that, 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 that nothing means anything, that there's just, you know, dominance, hierarchies, and power, that's all that exists. So that's the part that I, I again, as someone who's in the trenches, watching this technology of marriage run people over, and watching us as a society get worse and worse at it, and watching that have a disproportionate consequence on men and on children in terms of their exposure to their fathers, their exposure to their, the time-sharing range between their mother and fathers, the economic realities that come with the hardships that are created by divorce. I, I'm just trying to live in the real world. I understand that we all have visions of what utopia would look like for our respective, you know, theological perspectives. But in reality, the duties of a husband, the duties of a wife, the legal rights and obligations, that's that's the problem here, guys. And that we should be shooting at that target, not saying let's make it harder for people to get out of it and somehow that'll solve the problem. Well, well I think see, that's what I was going to uh, uh, you know, James, is that oh, sorry, that's what I was going to ask Andrew is like wait, how does the church marriage and church running divorce incentivize guys to want to get married? Knowing that, look, the way the divorce is now or marriage is now, it, it's it's not a good bet for men if they get with the wrong woman and or she changes her mind down the road. And then mm. now that he's paying alimony, child support, and he, does, he has to lose half of his assets or whatever in this process. So what? why would the church – I mean, wouldn't it be making it well, more – Well, how do you keep the women become, in line? Well, the question is, wouldn't it make guys want to become more secularists? No. If, if we we don't have to get married, we don't have to go through that if we're secularists. No, what so you find it- what you find find is the exact opposite trend. So you are finding that Christianity, as it was 
pitfalling. It is starting to uh, uptick on the increase, especially for the younger generation. The reason for this, again, is because the religious are having the children. And so the adoptation of values are going to be from your parents. That's how people adopt their values. So the value structures that they're getting are from their parents. If their parents are Christians, and they are because they're the ones having the most amount of children out there, it makes a lot of sense to state that, hey, there's going to be incentives because your value structure only can coexist with this infrastructure and it cannot coexist with this other infrastructure. Okay, but isn't that, that, Andrew, that isn't that going to, by your own definition, isn't that going to increase the number of people that falsely self-identify as Christian? Because you said earlier no, there's that, a safeguard. that this broad category yeah. of Christians yep, there's is a actually the re Okay, so I, I don't understand what that the is. The safeguard but. is the church. The church is the one who married you. They're the gatekeeper. Got so it. so it's, it's not church. a state. You're taking yeah. it out of the state entirely. Yeah. Yeah, so, so is the state, for example, still enforcing child support or is the church getting involved? In the that? church. I'm just trying to figure out yeah, who I'm going to be working for. The church would be the architects of these things. However, uh, when you're talking about it from a legalese standpoint, things like uh, child support, this type of thing, the church itself can be the arbiters of those things and probably would do a fine, a much finer job than a court system would. They know the couple. They know that the, this couple is in their community. The in, the the whole thing. Now let's assume. So basically, you're advocating for like Hasidic Judaism, except Christian. Soft Shiara. What do you? What, it's not well, Hasidic, Hasidic Judaism. Hasidic Judaism. Judaism yeah. What you have yeah, is your you best in. About? <laughs> well, the be Well, no, no. I'm 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 not being disparaging. Christians Christians in, have been in, governing in, marriages in Christian nations since the time for time forgot. Man, what do you mean? Right, but in the United States, we we don't have religious church tribunals, whereas in the United States, we do in Hasidic Judaism have a we best did. in, which well, is we a religion. We did. We did I, allow the church I, to take care of marriage and divorce. That was not a state infrastructure whatsoever. That's a brand new concept in the United States, not an old concept. But say, so, well, my question is, is that, okay, so now the church is going to be handling divorce. So that means churches are going to be implementing alimony and churches are going to be implementing uh, child support. And so probate then, law the as well. So then, so, then, yeah. so then what is the difference? The difference in distinction is that the church is going to be a much finer arbiter as your spiritual fathers in the church know you inside and out. They're intricately familiar with your situation and can adjudicate these things far better. You're submitting yourself to the church authority. Now, assume for a second that you refuse to do so. The church could excommunicate you, and then I guess technically you wouldn't be married. So no harm, no foul. I'd like to know so how do you get the women in line authorities of the church are in the first place, because a lot of this sounds like magical thinking, to be quite honest with you, because I will tell you right now, with the amount of people who get married, the amount of people who get I mean, James sees this every day. Like, I don't even know how many like cases you see and, and God knows what, what the divorce load is. But we already know that it's what 56 percent of, of marriages end in divorce. That's a you're going to go and unload that on on the church, which it simply no. doesn't have you're the projecting. So you're projecting forward that, that the church, the church church is the one also who is gatekeeping who's allowed to get married so they're not gonna right. unlike the state you can go down to a courthouse and say i want to marry this broad i met an hour ago they can't <laughs> say no you know maybe some states mm -hmm. can but many of them they're like okay here you go or there's two days to wait or something ridiculous like that a church can literally say to you no how do well, you know each other well, the, the, the you point know what i mean yeah, the point I made a minute ago that I, I, I understand Andrew was saying once in history certainly did exist and, and still exists in Vatican City. Um, it, I, I, again, I, I was tying it to Hasidic Judaism because Hasidic <laughs> Judaism has within it a religious legal structure, halacha. So right? does canonical the, the, law for orthodoxy. For Christianity. Right. So, so what I'm asking you is, would there be, for example, like there is a Toen in a Hasidic, you know, tribunal, a Bestin, a, 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 a Hasidic court, that's a, a religious lawyer, essentially. So all, all you're doing is taking the, the Are you just the like secular... hedging your bets? Oh my God. <laughs> Are you just hedging your bets? I'm trying to find new jobs. That's right. I, I just, I need job security here. I got kids to feed. <laughs> no, I, but, but I am asking the question about mapping this over it. You know, you're, you're, you're proposing this society you're still going to need judges. You're still going to need lawyers. You're still. I, I, please just tell me I'm not going to be out of a job. That's all I'm saying. I'm just That's trying what to understand like. <laughs> what we're going to do is that you still have to map 
evidence, right? There still has to be a judge. There still has to be some tribunal. It has to have some authority over you. So state power can levy your checks. It yeah, can there put are you in jail. there are canonical laws which still exist even I, to this I'm, day with Catholicism. Yes. Catholicism has its own structure for marriage. Yes, Orthodoxy would too. Protestants also have their own structures for various churches for marriage. What's allowed? What's not? You can look at Mormons. You can look at any number of different ones. They all have a governing body for this thing. Right, do, but that's only get, for the purpose of annulment, meaning for the termination of marriage, the grant of no, an annulment. Also, it has nothing to do with the division of property, has nothing to do with support, whereas in Hasidic Judaism, it does. They can say this is child for, support. It does for Christianity, too, traditionally. They can divide those things up as well. Traditionally the in the United authority. States? Not in the United States. Oh, okay. I, no, I was still hang, talking about the United, United States. States. Now, but about a century ago, century and a half ago, it was still very much up to the church. I, I wasn't practicing law. Can I, can I, like, like, can I ask a question? I got a question here. So like, as far as like, if we're going to make the church, quote, whatever, like the church, uh, the arbiters of who gets married, who gets divorced, who gets to have kids, who doesn't get to have kids. Um, because essentially if you can't have, uh, let's just say we're all playing by the rules. If you can't get married in the first place, you're not going to be able to fuck. So if you're not fucking, you're not having kids. So if that's the case, then who is the church that is the ones who be, who get to be the arbiters of this? Does that mean do, do we have a Jewish church that has their rules? Do we have a Christian Orthodox church, whatever it is, that has their rules? The Jehovah's Witness got their rules. Uh, the uh, you know the Muslims get their rules. The Hindus who are apparently outbreeding us all got their got their rules. Yeah, like what happens when the Baha'is don't want to do this, right? What yeah, happens when, Sikhs, when you start man, having an issue? Is what like, happened to the Sikhs? That, that's, you know? that's the issue. Yeah, that, that, I, I'm saying issue. It's like what happens who, if you who I, gets I, I to, which church gets to be the arbiter? Uh, Methodist, of, Baptist, or Episcopalian? Yeah. So this is a good question, and let me answer it as precisely as I can. There's multiple ways which this can be done. The first way is you could have independent church authority, where e individuals within their own religious denomination that's already recognized as being a legitimate religion, which, like Satanism, for instance, is not. That's not considered a legitimate religion, for instance. Uh, you could just make those recognized religions arbiters of their own kind of marriage contracts and values within the church. I don't see that as being particularly problematic. The second is, is that if you have, you know, X amount of your nation, if you're kind of doing a much broader perspective, uh, let's say it's all Orthodox or it's all Catholic, obviously it would fall under the dominion of that major church. Now, there's is there downsides to some of this? There's some downsides to it. However, I do think that what ends up happening over a sequence of reforms, especially over 50, 100, 150 years, these things become more consolidated in a singular body by necessity. So I think you'll start to see an emergence of more singular uh, churches, especially if they have a much more of a hand in governing uh, the things which they ought to govern, which is the spiritual welfare of the people who are going to them. I, I think it's the sexual welfare. Well, I was going to say, yeah, will the church tell my wife to fuck me three days a week or no? Can they? And if she doesn't, do they stone her? Like, what's the deal? No, well, they don't stone gang, her. That's as ridiculous. much as I'm enjoying uh, building a bridge to the 17th century, <laughs> they burn I, her. They burn I, her at the stake. Fair, <laughs> fair. <laughs> I was a little over the line. I get it. But the point still stands. Right? And there's the clip. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what's the statement is funny. Not burning women. Burning women is not funny. Let's make that. Yeah, very you know, that's what's clear. coming. That's all that's going to be up as the yeah, headline. Stoning tomorrow. women is that the statement is funny. Stoning women is not funny. That is not yeah, I think that to answer your question directly, do I think that the church uh, would heavily, it, just like any secularist counselor, would recommend that inside of a, a, a marriage where there's no sex, do I think that the counselors within the church would probably recommend that there was? Yes. Do I think that secularists do this all the time? Yes. I don't really see the distinction, to be honest with you. Oh, you mean like marriage counselors? Because they, we are, they are horrible. And I, here's the, this is the issue, though. The problem always be is somebody has to make a sacrifice, and it's always the guys. Marriage counselors, they don't tell guys what uh, their wife needs to do because the wife won't listen. They know this. Well, and the wife is also too. the one that drags they're them all, there. They're all women. Marriage counselors, Yeah, the wife is right? one that pays it. A lot of them are women <laughs> themselves. Yeah, so yeah. the reason people left the church was because the church stopped incentivizing men. You can call it hedonist or whatever, but it's literally it. It's always do more for the women sacrifice more for women be better for women and then women will reward you but then when women don't there is no enforcement so it's a one-sided enforcement that's true you're i agree with you so yeah Protestants, oh don't get me wrong so if protestant the Catholics churches have been heavily they've been heavily infiltrated by feminism no church is immune from feminism no church is immune from subversion i no. don't dispute that that's true 
All right. But we've also traditionally been the only safeguard that secularists have. We're it. Secularists yeah. aren't there to help secularists. I can tell you that. But it seems like the churches have been at the forefront of being anti-degeneracy, pro-marriage, trying to keep intact families together. Secularists damn sure haven't been. Well, they've been spending a hell of a lot of time talking about Troon stuff and bathrooms. So I don't know. Good. It's, it's help. It's that's part of the culture. You know, I don't know. There, a chick with a dick a, in the bathroom a, has never been a big factor in my marriage. So there's a joke in Utah that some of the jujitsu buddies of mine uh, who live in Utah. What about the Mendo? Once. <laughs> they, they no, they 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 say that, that, that why do you always why do you bring two Mormons with you when you go fishing? Because if you bring one, he'll drink all your beer. <laughs> that, that, that we're a, we're, a, watching him. <laughs> we're a self policing society, right? So this is not just in religious communities. This is in the broader world. So what is happening in the world? I, I think none of us would disagree. Is that the the roles that made marriage make sense okay like that became state enforceable meaning what people have to do in marriage became enforceable but it but there was a time where a woman who didn't cook for her husband was made to feel ashamed it was like what you don't take care of your husband look at you want to get a laugh stigma. go buy a 1950 copy of good housekeeping magazine <laughs> yes yeah, stigma based what is in there and what it says about what, how women should relate to the man in their life, how they should treat their children, how they should treat their husband, how they should treat each other, what their focus of their interest should be. The, the question really, and look, all of the societies, all the things that Andrew's talking about, the, the underneath these biblical concepts, or, are, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say underneath, as a result of these biblical concepts, you have defined roles of husband and wife that make the technology of marriage make sense. And it's enforceable either through state authority or through religious authority or the threat of divine punishment or the potential of divine reward. And so, stigma. And stigma. And, stigma. and, and, and yes, social stigma. stigma. That's yes. the point. It's social stigma. At this point, and that's why I said, conduct that little experiment. If a man says, I believe in fulfilling my duties as a husband, the, the roar of the crowd will be huge. If a woman says it, she will be pilloried primarily by other women. So while that is the case, while we're in that reality, not the reality that is being proposed here, while we're in that reality, I don't believe marriage will save the West. Which and while is the idea we here. are, and while we are in that reality, I would make the proposal that we should try to change that reality so that that's not what's happening. So that women do focus on their duties. And one of the things which you can do that you brought up, and by the way, the same study that I cited brings up social stigma as well. Social stigma is a key factor, and if people are going to churches and especially if churches are the governing bodies for this churches can be very over the top with stigmatization of negative behavior we've even even seen this as recently as what happened with dylan mulvaney and uh, the budweiser fiasco and these various boycotts which have happened those are all forms of stigmatization towards behaviors that we don't like and they're headed by religious people we are the gatekeepers for morality Andrew, and society, because we there isn't time, any other. Hey, Andrew, really? when was the last ever... time you heard the pastors tell the wives, you need to suck some dick? Like, <laughs> oh my God, like when was I the, know it's I, crass, but he's not clip. wrong. But like, yeah, I mean, when, when I was I was in church this morning, right? And the, the guy was talking about husbands, you need to love your wives. And he didn't even finish oh, doing anything cool. else. So he, he didn't even talk about submission. He didn't talk about how you're not supposed to withhold yourself from your spouse for unless it's a certain amount of time. He didn't talk about oh, that being really? sexual immorality. So it's like, what church is doing that? And, and how when, are they going on, to enforce that? The, so first on top of, all, of that too, have you guys ever seen a wife? Oh, oh, sure. Go ahead, I'm Ryan. Trying to, oh, trying to answer, I was gonna say, so. have you ever seen a wife that was told I have to fuck my husband, it's part of my duties? Have you ever seen that kind of performance? Do you know yes. what kind of misery that is for people? It's horrible. Why I don't know horrible? if it's even a good suggestion. It's, it's equitable to rape right now is what it is. That's it, why. Well, we're even if it wasn't, you're just going to get a girl who lays there. It's like a wormhole. It's a sex doll. It's like the whatever. There's a lot podcast. of like presuppositions that you bake into this. That I don't even believe are true. I do think that uh, in a marriage what, between between men and women, especially a Christian marriage, that women do see it as a duty to fulfill their end of the wedding vow, which would include sex. Otherwise, you, that's where babies come from, just so you know. And there's a reason that Christians are breeding more than anybody else. They're having plenty of sex. I don't know where this idea comes from 
that there's sticks in the mud that don't have sex. It's not true. It's ridiculous on its face. And yes, I do think as part of marriage counseling through a church, they would probably say because the relationship of a marriage is supposed to be the man represents the head of the church or the woman, the body. I think that they would recommend not to have cold bed and to have intimacy and all these things because they do now. They do now. Can in you negotiate counseling. that, though? Can you tell a girl she's not in love with her <laughs> husband, but she sticks with him because that's what the church says? She doesn't want to have sex with him, but she does that because of what the church says. Do you have any idea how horrible that performance will be? It's she no, will lay listen, there. That's she will no disassociate. Hor- that, that's no more horrible now than what you have now under People are just leaving rather than dealing with it. No, no, they still have to deal with it. Okay, and then Guys, they have to deal with the ramifications are, are, of divorce and the ramifications of having half their shit taken and everything else because she refuses to is. do this. But, Whereas but, the church could look at this holistically and say, listen, if there is a fault and we did have to take the marriage and dissolve it, we don't have to give you half of his shit, do we, lady? <laughs> you know what but, I mean? But, but the question is, is, is our society incentivizing and is our society um, really pushing on anyone or is anyone really buying into the idea of being married. I I understand that our society loves getting married. They love the weddings, they love the dress, they love all the fucking parties, (laughs) they love all the presents. It's like, look at what it's turned into. There's like a party before the party. and then It's an industry, yeah, it's a whole industry. It's an entire industry, but it's also an industry of incentives designed to incentivize women to do it. Right. For women to demand it, for women to want it, for women to say, I'm going to, you know, I want this to be the goal, not to be married, not because there is any value in marrying, having children, any of those kinds of things. The idea is look at how cool you get to be a princess and not just on the day, before the day, the night before, the week before, a year before. Yes. So, so what we're doing is we're creating a system where everyone's super excited to get married, but no one has any idea how to fucking be married. I agree. And guess what? You get married for this, and then you are married for this. Like, getting married is all, you know, I hate to quote Kid Rock, but he said, there's nothing more fun than getting married, nothing worse than being married. And yeah. that's the challenge. That's because women today marry a lifestyle. They don't marry the man. They want their lifestyle. They want the Instagram. They want the they want the highlight reel right now. And I'm going to say this right now. Just I agree. To clarify a few things here. And I still think it's magical thinking. However, I will say this is that the only, let's just say for sake of argument, we could get to your marriage utopia with the church being the arbiters. Under, let's just say we could get there. It doesn't start with convincing guys. It doesn't start with even it doesn't even really start in the church. You know where this starts is it starts convincing the women who want to marry a lifestyle rather than wanting to marry the guy or whatever it, it starts convincing them that what you're saying is a great is is the best way to go which so means we need women to arbitrate so, it but here's the thing is if i'm going to go and say that you know well ladies uh once you get married you're gonna have to you're gonna have to fuck your husband at least four times a week you're gonna have to give him a hummer on the, on your off weeks and you're gonna have to you know cook him a steak and and you're gonna be do like submit to his authority whatever else that is going to be a much taller order to sell than it is to tell sell guys to say, hey, oh, you're going to get this if you if you follow the church and you're going to be and you're going to you know sort of defer authority to the church as far as your your marriage and your your uh, you know divorce marriage whatever. Go, it's going to be a much easier sell for guys because they're like guys live in a state of sexual deficit. The the eighty percent of the more beta male guys that are out there right now they're they're be happy to sign up for that right now because it means they're getting laid when they're not getting laid. Yep. It's the women that you're going to have to say. Uh, but ladies, I'm sorry to say this, but you, you're, you're going to have to do duty sex. Well, let me give you a little bit of pushback obligation right now. Yeah, but let me give you a little pushback here. So women follow trends and women have always followed trends and that's what they do. And that's the reason stigma is so effective and propaganda is so effective on women. But stigma mm-hmm. especially is effective. So behavior that women find society stigmatizes, they won't go anywhere near it. This has been, I mean, this has been well studied, especially by the United States military. Even the MK Ultra Project studied this in depth. They go with what the propaganda says. Propaganda has a negative annotation, but you guys understand what I'm saying. They go where the social stigma tells them they can't go. So if you have virtuous men who are really promoting this and saying, we're not going to reward you by marrying you, absent these virtues, women necessarily will start to move towards that. Is it going to be immediate? No. Is it going to happen right now? No. But stigmatization and kind of mass propaganda works more effectively on them than any other sect, period. 
It well, and to piggyback, so basically to piggyback, saying it's to piggyback off of what Andrew just, just said, because Andrew and I, Andrew and I, I agree I on something. For the record here, I would much rather have a woman who wants to fuck the shit out of me than one who feels like she is obligated to fuck the shit out of me. How would you know the distinction? You can tell. I, have you <laughs> ever had sex with well, a girl? Like, you know the distinction. Huh? Yeah, Andrew, you are cordially invited to Access Vegas. Any of the dates we're doing, <laughs> right now, we'll be right now. fly you out, put you up, be on the show. We'll have that conversation. We'll go. You. We'll yeah. we'll we'll do it. I I got to go out and visit my family in Reno anyway. I told oh, my I wife. Know. I said, what we'll do? We'll go out to Reno and then we'll get a car from Reno and drive up to Vegas for a couple of days and hang out with. There you go. That yeah. sounds like yeah, fun. Bro, I, I, mean, I think to I think to support already. what Andrew just said actually is is the statistic I cited earlier about divorce as a social contagion. I think actually ties very closely to what he just said, which is social sure. stigma and social support. I, I would actually say it's not even the stigma piece. The stigma is the antidote to it. The reality is, is that as long as women are telling other women it is de rigueur or disgusting or, or, or uh, shameful to want to be a dutiful wife, to want to please your husband, right. to feel any sense of obligation to, to your husband's happiness, um, to, to have any sense of duty towards him and to facilitating his happiness, as long as that's the case, then yeah, we're, we're going to have no success at this technology. Again, especially when the promises of the man are are enforceable through state power. So James, say and it. The others so are not shaming. Just say it. Just say, say what? it. Say we need horse shaming. Just get it out. Horse we shaming? need horse shaming. I, 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 I you know. You're like, well, right there, come on, man. Just the rest of the way. I want my own clip. We need <laughs> horse shaming. That is a tough one. That but is, we need uh... horse shaming, but we need to, to shame our wives to be our whores. <laughs> because, like, you can't uh, have your wife ways, your whore. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I mean, you want her to be your slut, right? Like, you want her to, to do all the freaky things. Because the question is, if so many Christians, that's are the fucking, antithesis of a whore. Oh, that's not a whore. No, so no I, I think I think what Glenn is trying to say is the is the axiom which I agree with, that. which is that every man wants a girl, a, a good girl who's bad just for him, Maybe and wants every woman spy. wants a good, a slut. bad boy who's good just for her. Yeah, yeah, that's not what we what we as a society look at as a uh, as a, pro a proverbial whore, right? We're looking at no. either a person who engages <laughs> in prostitution or they're very promiscuous or things like that. Not, oh, you have a nice wife at home and you have sex with her a lot. That's ridiculous, man. But Andrew, it, it, well, that's kind of so the important many, one, isn't it? Andrew, you're saying Christian, you're not, you're not seeing a problem with Christians having sex. You're saying that, that Christians are fucking, right? Well, if so many Christian guys are fucking, then why are so many Christian men addicted to porn? Is it because one, A, they're not getting enough sex or two, they're getting boring sex and they rather watch more entertaining oh, sex no, no, Glenn, than the boring the sex the, of the porn, though. Glenn, it could be the pervasiveness of porn additionally. Like porn is- And the invasive, you know, yeah, it's very invasive. Yeah, so, so if you think of like what Andrew Huberman talks about, it's like the dopamine, like even your your incredible sex life with your wife is still not going, there's always something you can type into the little search bar and make it even greater. Right, what could, possibly compete, what could possibly compete that, with that, pornography? That's, def that's definitely- Like there, there is almost no reality that could compete with pornography in terms of its of its effect on your physiology. Wait, my so, wife can't get caught in the dryer? God damn. A few. A few. <laughs> I got this question from one of the guys in the chat here asking about are there stats for sexless marriages? Oh yes. Oh yeah, tons. Yeah, there, there are the infographics <laughs> dedicated to this. Hey, friend. listen, I call that job security, guys. That yes. is right there. Yes. That is there my. I'm always looking for job security. This ladies, guy he's just ladies. hedging every bet all the time. Ladies, <laughs> hey, he's ladies, be a winner. <laughs> Don't blame me, head. Andrew. Blame money and its usefulness in every fucking situation. Okay, yeah, so. Good point. And good point. in case you're wondering if there's a difference between obligatory sex and desire sex, I exhibit A, counselor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely much. I don't want to horse shame any of them because they're all good. They're all wonderful people. Who are so what Andrew's better. suggesting is that we need Christian women that are married to tell other Christian women that are not sucking their husband's dick enough. You need to go home and go suck some dick, woman. You're not being a good wife. You need to go go over there and and. Desire your husband and suck that dick. Shame them back into. <laughs> I can just feel those panties wetting right <laughs> so, now. Uh, so as as, right as now, crude bro? as crude as that was put, I do think that women often, especially longtime married women who have been successful at it and have good marriages, often will tell younger women uh, that they should probably provide. Uh, that type of comfort to their husband, and that they have all a duty right, to do all so. Right, all right. <laughs> do you think women enjoy sex, Andrew? Yeah. 
Do you think it's possible if they don't enjoy sex? I mean, not with you, Ryan, but yes. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's the that's like a real, like, I have a lot of cash. He's got the statistics on that. He, he has it's the not numbers. about statistics. Yeah, I get it. But 97% of your ex-lovers say sex is awful. I mean, it's just <laughs> every, it's, every it's Catholic a few research study. I have in my community has like two concerns. One, how do I get my wife to stop yelling at the kids? It's practical. The second one is, how do I stop my repressed wife and get her to have sex like she cares? And well, why, did they, why did they for, marry somebody who wouldn't have sex with them? Well, here's the thing. 20 years, the church is like, sex is wrong, sex is you evil, you're that. going to hell if you have sex, and then they get married. What and church? And the church turns around. Uh, any church. They do no not. church wants a girl to fuck around before she's married. Yeah, before None. she's married. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, though. Now that she's married, they're like, have a bunch of sex, enjoy it. You're going to unbrainwash 20 years of sex being the devil. It's hard. It's basically a social gaslighting yeah. thing. And you no, I don't think you have to advertise sex. I think sex advertises sex. I, I think that, that, that you don't have to, um, you know, like people don't have to have the warm ups to maybe you need it to get good at it. But it's I not don't know what think I think that... either. It's what the it's what the Catholic husbands are reporting back. Right. I got but, a but... nice virginal wife and now she's so sexually repressed that I have to unbrainwash an entire lifetime. But of even the example that you just gave, which is that they're, the wives are, are yelling at the kids to the two complaints the men are having is that the wives yeah. are yelling at the kids too much and that the wives aren't having sex. And that's a leadership satisfying sex so them. OK, yeah. so then maybe if the man was doing a better job of being like, you know, responsible for making sure that the children did the things that they were supposed to do. She might be impressed with that and might say, wow, I want to fuck that guy. Again, this is all so hypothetical. It's These not. I'm all... dealing with it every day, though. Is, I, I listen, am, too. They can when get it, when it doesn't things, work yeah. out, I agree with I, they you end that up there in my are, office. There is, a, there is a percentage of uh, like Puritan style churches that do have this kind of over the top sexual repression right which is yeah they're yelling at whores which is designed well well, hang on which is designed even post-marriage they have kind of these bizarre repressions that was not for marriage right but this is not traditional inside of christianity (laughs) well aren't those the ones right now that are thriving with the birth rates no (laughs) no it's the ones that aren't Fire and no, brimstone? it's the ones that are having sex or having the babies. I, I know dude, babies, like one and one and equals sex. two. You know what I mean? You got to have sex to have the babies, bro. Hey, James. I, I, I've, yeah, but there's the go. procreation sex people that say uh, sex. Yeah, but they're rare. Is considered they're sin. rare. They're rare. Yeah. Uh, James, let me let me uh, since uh, on that note, uh, James, can you <laughs> can you tell me the story? Can you tell us and my audience the story about the guy who was getting the hand jobs from the t- from the massage? Oh God, and, this and is they, a heartbreaking story. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. So yeah, I had a, he play, I had a he, client. Oh, he plays for the Browns now, doesn't he? That's, That's right. No, I, I had a client who was a very successful guy and and uh, had two fairly young kids, and uh, his wife just stopped sleeping with him. Um, she just. You know, and again, she she always had an excuse. It was, you know, uh, got a headache or, well, I'm tired from the kids or whatever it might be. And and, and according to him, and again, I'm not in their bedroom, but according to him, he, he tried to be, you know, create romantic settings and things like that. She just was not interested. And he's like, you know what? Something I have to beg for is not fun anyway. Um, and so eventually he kind of gave up. And they went six years without having sex. And at about year five, He's just figured out, okay, I, I got to do something here because you know, porn's just not doing it anymore. I got to do something. So rather than get a girlfriend and all the potential issues that could come with being a married person with a girlfriend, he's decided, you know what? I'm just going to go to these massage places where for like 50 bucks I can get a hand job. He wasn't having sex with these women. He wasn't even having oral sex with them. He was just getting the hand jobs, getting the full release. That was it. He was doing it maybe, you know, once every couple of weeks. Well, she found out about this. She found out about it actually once the divorce was already commenced. So there was a divorce action commenced. She filed a divorce against him eventually, um, just essentially dissatisfied with the marriage, um, which is kind of humorous because she was the one who was dissatisfied with the marriage. And then in reviewing all the financial statements and comparing them to phone records, she basically saw, okay, wait, he was calling these numbers and then he was doing an ATM withdrawal. So she started to correlate those two things together and figured out that he was going to these places. And you know, the bottom line is she tried to use this to say that he shouldn't have visitation with his children without a court approved supervisor. She tried to argue that he should be drug tested um, because if he engaged in that illicit activity, it was not a logical jump to say that he was also an illicit drug user because one is illegal and the other is illegal. Um, and, and, you know, this became like a unbelievably contentious issue. Thankfully, you know, my client came to me and he said, look, should I deny this? Should I, because none of these women, you're not going to be able to subpoena these women and they're not going to 
him in and say, yes, I'm a prostitute and I masturbated him for money, they're, they're all going to say it was just a sensual massage. And what I said is, look, just own it. Just own it. Be honest. Say, look, you know what? Yes, I, I'm a fool. I, I, I went five years without sex in my marriage. And then I finally got so lonely that I was like, I got to do something for a release of this kind. And, and that's what I did. And how is it really any different than getting, uh, you know, going to a strip club? How is it any really that different other than the fact that there's some physical touch that ultimately ends in, in, in some kind of an orgasm? So look, the, you know, thankfully in that situation, the legal system, you know, saw the truth and figured it out, you know, probably $50,000 worth of legal fees later. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, this, these are the marriages, these are the reality of people's marriages. And look, respectfully, again, we can all aspire to their... That guy should be allowed to get a divorce. I'm sorry. If your wife didn't have sex with you for five years, I think you have a right yeah, to say I want a divorce. Here's the thing. The church may very well agree that under those circumstances that they would have, he would have a right to get a divorce. That's one. And then second, Rolo just brought up the percentages of people who are in a sexless marriage. What you're talking about are still outliers. They're not the majority. So you can say, hey, these wait, are what the realities. Is not, wait, what is you can say that people who are in sexless marriages. So That's you can say... Minority. Wait, where yeah. are you be, Where are you getting that info from? I've got it right here. He just put it up. Twenty percent of twenty percent of married people haven't hey, had I'm sex in the past year. Go that's ahead. A, that's, I'm can, can you, you guys have so, so much so confidence in self-reporting? Well, so, man. so hang it on. Is amazing. So, well, well, let me finish well, my point okay. here. I'm almost well, done. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm almost done. So, anyway, I'm saying that by his own stats, you can see for yourself that this is these are the outliers, not the inliers. So this mostly doesn't happen. While I agree with right? you, yeah, while I agree with you that maybe it, it, it does happen to some degree, the churches still have to contend with those same problems. I agree that that's true. However, I think that under undergoing this type of counseling outside of a secular framework is probably a lot better for addressing these kinds of problems. But there's no guarantee that they wouldn't grant a divorce uh, under these circumstances either. So if you look at the stats yourself, you can kind of look at them and see for yourself hey, this is not the majority of people, so we shouldn't be using this as an example and kind of putting it on the majority and saying, I think that people should get to divorce for this reason. Maybe the church agrees with you. I've also got... I've also so got we've just changed the boss, is, same boss as the old boss. I've got not to, the same uh, boss as the old boss. Oh, I, I have a, I have a, I have a Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I have a, not I have a the same company, James. not the same anything. <laughs> well, I mean, we just hand-waved away 20% of men who are absolutely miserable, so I don't you're, know. You're, you're, Inside you're of a secular scored. marriage? I'm not shocked. Why would they get married to begin with? Uh, guys, this is also self-reported data. Oh, I mean, right, who, right, who right, here right, really right. puts this much on self-reported data? If that 20% of men... Wait, wait, wait. All the data that you cited at the very beginning of the panel was all self-reported data. All of Actually, it. Actually, no, that's not true. And what are you basing that on, Andrew? It's the CDC's Bureau of how Vital Statistics. It's how what percentage of people divorce. I'm sorry. Do you I think, think that the wait? Are you divorce. suggesting that the same measure for are you having sex in your marriage is the same as what religion is a person who was granted a judgment of divorce? God, Andrew, every time I'm making a point, you cut me off halfway through it. You like, just, is it, are you that afraid of someone making a point? Then answer it directly. Was a lot of that data I just or not? Yeah, I, I was yeah, in the middle of answering go. that when you cut me off the fifth time. Okay, well, you just gave me the answer. Yes. No, I, I didn't give you the answer. Oh, my God, dude. You're, you're, you're... Mike, go. Okay. <laughs> uh, my, my question, James. The Listen, when you guys move to the Handmaid's Tale Society that uh, that, that Andrew is signing <laughs> oh, on <laughs> for <laughs> here, where, so where Jesus terrible. runs the divorce laws, just let me know. But until then, man, I got to tell you, like, this is fucking Mike, exhausting. Mike, 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 go make your point, oh, Mike. Sorry. Uh, James, uh, the first thing I thought when I heard that story is she is cheating. And I was just curious. This is, I know this is a little, a little bit out, outside the bounds, but as a divorce attorney, would yeah. you be the person to hire a private investor? Like, I will yeah. tell you right now, I don't know the situation. Yeah, she's there. not that cheating. That woman, there's no way. No, she's You're just kidding. honestly, she just she just gave the fuck up. She she got married, put it on a bunch she, of weight. Like, she's, oh, she's, okay, I think she's if overweight. anything, if okay. you said to me what's going on with her, I, I can't tell you other than to say that my guess would be she's clinically depressed or she's got something so, going so, on. So she never she never lost the weight from the pregnancy. She doesn't feel good about herself and her body. Um, the two of them are, I think, incompatible people in terms of, of their view of things. And, you know, I, 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 I really don't I don't think it's that she was running around. I, I think so, that's totally so, my experience of infidelity with women in, in, in the legal system and in terms of my client base is when women are fooling around, they're much quicker to leave the marriage. Men are much quicker to have affairs and not leave the marriage for them. Women who have like extended affairs 
they're out. They're out. They found yeah, a soft place that, to land. They're out the door. That, that, that would go along mm -hmm. with Dr. Buss's thing about 83% of women uh, uh, who cheat fall in love with their affair partners. Oh, uh, don't the, tell that one to roll Yeah, up. again, though, the <laughs> problem I have with this, and, you know, again, I, I, it's, all statistics are not created equal. So things yeah. like why did you leave your marriage is a self-reporting. Okay. Sure. Why did you, why did you, why did your marriage fail? Do you feel the other person contributed to it more than you or the same as you? These are all self-reporting and they're very subjective concepts. Whereas what educational level did a person who received a judgment of divorce? Th this is not the That's same not kind of statistic. Yeah. What ethnicity is this person? That is not a, a self report of what they but are. But you, you also gave us other stats. You also gave us other stats, which is the reasons that they gave for these different justifications. Those are no, self reports. No, no, yes, the, you the, did. The you over, did give us those. Oh, oh, Andrew, okay. rewind it. The, the, the majority of the statistics I was citing had to do with educational level, income level, ethnicity, religion. Again, reported religion. Now you're moving you the goalpost to majority Dude. right so it's hold like on, okay on, majority but you still are using self-reported data yourself and then when it's presented to you you're like why do you guys have faith in the self-reported data it's like then don't use it bro um my, my other question for you james was do you think uh, i mean SSR am i going to get to answer it or does andrew oh, just want to cut me off now go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah the floor Gen the gentleman from new york has the floor <sighs> That that'd be you, James. Yeah, I I wanted to hear the question. I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. What was it? Oh my bad. So uh, you're talking about me. So <laughs> yeah, you uh, do you think the SSRIs would have something to do with that? So like we talk about like it lowers sex drive. In this case, you're talking about a woman. She kept on the weight. So this goes back to the stuff that Orion and Glenn were talking about. You know, women putting on uh, the weight. So now she does that. She takes the SSRIs for her depression. Maybe for postpartum, she gets prescribed something like this. Uh, she gets prescribed something like this. And then at that point, now there is no sex, which then leads to five years of sexlessness. Mm -hmm. And then have you seen a correlation between those things? Yeah, I mean, in my book, I talk a lot about sort of a death spiral that I think happens in marriages, which is the, the and it can be reversed, which is the good news. You know, that, that, that what happens in a good relationship is I'm treating you kind, so you want to treat me kind. I tell you you're beautiful, so you feel good about me, and then you're going to want to have sex with me. Like, th th this is what happens in courtship, guys. Is courtship is, you know, I treat you a certain way, you want to treat me a certain way, and there's this built-in system. Well, it works in the reverse as well, unfortunately, and that's who ends up in my office. Is it, it becomes, well, you're constantly at work. Well, I'm constantly at work because you make financial demands on me. Well, I make financial demands on you because I'm unhappy. You know, like, and, pe and people are hitting all the wrong targets. And I, I think the place where Andrew and I very much agree is that society is no, society is now antagonistic to marriage to a dramatic degree, that there is no longer any social stigma. If, if a woman leaves a marriage, it was a voyage of self-discovery. If a woman has an affair, it's because her husband wasn't meeting her emotional or sexual needs That's and she needed true. to go eat, pray, yeah. love, all those things. Whereas if a man does it, it's because he's a piece of shit. Or if a man leaves a marriage, it's because he's weak and he's not committed and he doesn't believe in commitment. There, there is an absolute, absolute one-sided thing happening here. And again, until women, buy into that concept and say, hey, wait a minute, we should be as sisters to other women saying, hey, you're treating this guy like a schmuck. Of course, he's not going to treat you wonderfully. And then you're going to be unhappy and you're going to find another guy. And then you're going to start that same cycle all over again with them. When in fact, what you have at home, you probably could make it into something really nice if you treated him better. And then he might want to treat you better. And there can be this positive spiral. Again, not in every relationship. Sometimes people just make bad choices. But that is the incentive system that has to come into play. And until it does, I, I think Andrew and I, one of the rare places we very much agree here is that that, that men should probably refrain from getting married while the system is lopsided in that fashion. Mm. And until there can be some structure of marriage that, that creates incentives on both sides, and that maintains those incentives on both sides. I mean, the community that Andrew is talking about. I feel like I've I changed think, your mind on this. <laughs> well, no, I think what you pointed out to me, and I, and I tend to agree with, I, I don't think your points are poorly made. I, I agree with most of them. It's just, I think the statistic 
argument is to me never the best one and this idea of no fault that like well if we can stop people from getting out of marriages that somehow these other downstream that they're downstream effects i don't think they are i think the fundamental problem is this problem this problem that we're identifying and agree yeah. on and why don't we as a group go after that problem and make and prescriptions that, for it and okay. use reforms and try to do social shaming and stigma based I love it. It's great. And I'm glad to see you over <laughs> on my side, brother. All right. All right. All right. We need like, you here. <laughs> we need you here in the worst way. Go back to James. So so what I was I, I'm I'm actually fascinated by this concept of like the over a prescription of SSRIs and then it actually reduces for some people it reduces their sex drive, right? So oh, it's instead huge. of sure. let's go to the gym, instead sure. of let's go to the gym, because testosterone also regulates a woman's sex drive as well, right? She goes to the gym, she lifts weights that she's going to have higher testosterone levels. She's more likely uh, to, that's a cure for divorce, going on walks, spending time with your family, r rescuing animals. These are, believe it or not, these are actual cures for uh, depression as well. So one of the things is what, what I'm saying is the overprescription. So uh, we, let's start off. We have a society that glorifies Cardi B drugging men when she was a prostitute and robbing them. We have a society that, that uh, like you said, the eat, pray, love society. There was a society where divorce for women is glorified and it's just basically something that was inevitable and needed to happen in order for her to express herself and to show her freedom uh, in, in those situations. Now, we have women who are in marriages and they're watching this on social media and they feel fear of missing out. They start feeling depression from these things. And this depression that they feel, oh, I'm just not, I can't feel it. I don't feel like I could be myself around you. They start having problems in the marriage and then they go to some sort of uh, physician. The physician then over prescribes or has an incentive for Zoloft and Xanax and all these other things. This depression then reduces their libido. The libido then causes their husband to be in a, se in a sexless situation. We've, we've seen several studies that show as men have sex, have more sex, it raises their self-esteem, and now we're yeah. lowering their self-esteem. And so what I'm saying is it's a societal spiral. You were talking about a, a spiral within a marriage, and I'm talking about a macroeconomic societal spiral that 100%. then leads to- It's more to, than just these, that too, though. Yeah, There's 100%. the cult of the child. Girls leave their kids in bed till the kids are like older, saying that's healthier for them. It's a buffer. Girls sometimes even put massive amounts of pillows on the bed. They gain weight and they don't want to lose it. The SSRIs, it's all root factor. I don't want to have sex with this guy. And so they do all of these things. So it's not their fault. It's not my fault. I'm depressed on SSRIs. It's not my fault. I gained weight and he doesn't find me attractive. It's right. this plausible deniability. And it's a fundamental way that women do this. And the reason that I was pushing back so much against that argument about, well, women should. It's like, that's great. But you can't hand wave away. 20% of people as a small problem to deal with. If you can't answer, and there, if you want to make the religious revival, that 20% of sexless married dudes, there's your demographic you want to go for. Show them ways to be attractive. Show them a way to make their wife wet for them. Show them how their wives will stop so, having the kids sleep in the bed, wet in their panties, get off of SSRIs, lose some weight. Nobody from any traditional conservative background has ever addressed it. They hand wave it away. They use because statistics the to hide the issue with so, so, or they so say or they say uh, it'll sort itself out. Trust me. And it's hand waved away. And I don't pray like it, it more. Pray about it. Pray it away. So, so, yeah. So, Glenn, Glenn, you might say, oh, oh, Glenn, I don't know if you agree with me. So less is all often more Anavar. Is that what you think? Yeah. Uh, Trend yeah. Lawrence, what do you say? <laughs> I say what do you think, Trend Lawrence? Take more tests and you get more sex. There we go. <laughs> what was that question you I, had? I'm no, not standing nothing. by that. I'm not standing by that. I'm just, so, that no, so, so my question uh, Andrew, you said that you acknowledge that feminism has infiltrated the church, right? So wouldn't it be safe to say that since feminism has infiltrated the church, that until the church was able to get rid of feminism from the church, the church would just, when the church would govern marriage just as a softer version of the state ran marriage. So nothing ever works in a monolith this way. If you're talking about is the church under consistent attack from secularist ideas, which would include the major one of feminism? Rolo has rightly pointed out on his show, the one thing he says I couldn't agree with more, that the very air that humanity breathes inside of the West now, you can't get away from feminism. It's leached into the very pores of our being at this point. Egalitarianism, feminism, all of this. It's all nonsense, right? But it's leached in. The church will always have all, all, whether it's Protestant churches or it's the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church, are always going to have a continual battle with secular ideas and a continual battle against feminism. You can't remove it, in other words. As long as there are secularists with these ideas, they always, and to, to kind of give you even more of an example of this, 
some of the biggest secular outreach programs for major secular think tanks and progressive think tanks use tons and tons of cash to go to different churches in order to give their clergy training seminars on how to better deal with their the churchgoers who go to these churches, right? Throw bags of money at them. And that's one of the ways that they become kind of invaded. So it's an it's always going to be an ongoing battle. You can never really say when we get rid of X, can we then start doing this? Because you can't really ever get rid of it. it this kind of ideology will always be around. You have to just con continuously combat it, just like the nature of evil. You can't just get rid of evil and then we can do good things because you'll never be able to do good things because evil will always be present. It'll always be prevalent. So then how would the church combat? Like, I just really would like a, a good example of like, an, uh, an example of how would the church combat a sexless marriage? And, uh, and, they would and, do and, it. And, then, yeah. and how would, it, if, let's say that that didn't work, how did, so then does the guy have to pay now alimony? He's been married for 10 years to so his wife. Now his wife doesn't want to have sex with them. And, you know, they've been having, having had sex in like two years. Now he wants a divorce. And the church is like, okay, fine, we'll grant you a divorce, but does he still get stuck with alimony? Does yeah, I doubt get... it. I mean, I doubt it. That's She'll not get child a, support. That's in the not back a. End. That's not a traditional theme, and neither necessarily is child support, but whether providing for the children. One of the ways the secularists deal with this, and I'm sure our lawyer friend can tell you, uh, the way that the court sees it is it's a lifestyle thing. So oftentimes child support is paid so that the children have the same lifestyle at both parents' houses. I think that the church would view that completely differently and probably for good reason. They're looking at the kind of the benefit. Again, you look at everything as a holistic. A court system can't do that. They don't know anything about you. You're just, a, you know, number 204 on the docket or whatever. Uh, they don't have a holistic approach and they can't provide a holistic pro approach. So are they going to make mistakes like every every institution? Yes, of course. But I think that they'll do a lot better through counseling and through things like this to aid in those kinds of marital problems, which is why even now, if secularists uh, or even Christians have these issues and they get marriage counseling, sometimes a marriage counselor will say, go to your church and talk to your priest. Uh, he might be able to help aid you in this. I mean, these people talk to thousands of people a day uh, or not a day, but, you know, a week or a month or whatever. They sure seem to be able to render aid in this arena. There's no doubt that that's true. I think most good lawyers do the same thing. I, I will tell you unequivocally, and I'm, I'm not, you know, self-aggrandizing. I, I tell anybody who comes into my office who I think there's any chance that, that marriage could be reconciled and that these people could find happiness. I send them to, to counseling, to a therapist. I encourage them to consider other possibilities. I wrote a fucking book about it. I mean, you know, my book is a book about how to stay married. Um, and how to try to take the same ingredients and, and make it into something that works better. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of the problem here, and I, I, I hate to, you know, to, to say, I think the problem is women more so than men. I think that men, yeah, men have to step up. Men have to be good providers again. Men have to take care of their bodies. I think Michael's absolutely correct. I think men have to be the kind of men, high value men that women value. But I think that men could do that all fucking day long. And as long as other women, are incentivizing women mm. to not love their husbands, respect their husbands, fuck their husbands, be value, consider their husbands to have value, regard really anything above the self. Like self-esteem has been taught to women now as an incredibly important virtue, but what do they esteem other than the self? Because that seems to be the, the, the only thing that really is being pushed now from the time a little girl's a little girl is that she is the most important thing in the world. And that's where I, I actually think some of the trad wife movement to other women. And by the way, I, I don't know if you follow progressive liberal media, but, but I try I to, I always try to, yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of women who are progressive, feminist, self-purported, very far left women who secretly acknowledge that they watch Mormon trad wife social media like they're like like we would watch pornography like because they sort of the like they know heavily, they, yeah, because they feel like dirty impossible. watching it but they're like wow Niche look at now. that like yeah. they're sort of like look at the life that they're yeah. living because I, I genuinely believe there is something in them that goes this might actually be something that would give me joy but i'm ashamed to say it out loud why yeah. not because men are going to be mad but because all the other women are going to go how dare you and so perfect this, a change has so to then happen reform, in yes 
change in the perspective of reform reform needs to begin immediately we need to start reforming towards those things using societal stigma and using whatever advances that we can via the legislative arm and via the cultural arm which is available to us i'm not i don't think these things will happen overnight any more than you do but don't you think that we should start we can't sit around and wait for them to correct themselves because they're not going to correct I don't themselves. Think, I don't think that any kind of reform is going to be effective unless it takes into account human biology, human evolution, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary sure. biology, anthropology, sociology, neurology, endocrinology. And, and that's my, my biggest problem with saying, okay, guess what? Here's a better way. Here's your utopia. Let's take marriage and we'll just give it back to the church and they get to be the arbiters of what's what's right and what's wrong for, for marriage. Let's take it away from the courts. Let's take it away from the government let's take it from them we're going to go back to the old school ways and we're going to let the the priests and the rabbis and the the imams and whoever else be the ones who are the ar arbiter of all of that and yet it still doesn't take into a to effect or taken into account that that biology trumps conviction well, wait every, a second though mm -hmm. every single time it, it does and i'll tell you this because when when i go and i look at stats that say like 68 70 percent of guys who are self-identifying christians have a problem with pornography addiction that's what i'm talking about right there it has nothing to do with marriage it has to do with those guys jerking off it has everything to do with the, and you can say well it's pornography it's a societal problem no it's a biology problem and when we start talking about how oh well we should just initiate duty sex as part of this great grand utopian scheme where we're going to have all these guys all these guys defer everything to the church unless the church has some sort of background and sort of like red pill praxeology or something like that they're never going to take into account the fact that women are not going to want to have sex with their husbands and it's going to be non-consensual consensual sex, which, according to today's society, that ends up is is tantamount to rape at this point. But when you utilize it, what to, until we go and we address the fact that there's a there are biological issues. I don't want a woman who fucks me because she feels obligated to fuck me. I want her to fuck me because she has she wants to rip my clothes off because she can't if she can't stand the thought of me being away from her. That's what I'm talking about. So when we're talking about genuine desire. We're talking about the difference between obligated compliance and genuine desire unless that church takes that into account. And I don't see that happening just simply because of the nature of the church. I don't and whatever we're calling the church at that point. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is that biology always trumps conviction. And if you don't think that, just have a look at any religious leader at some point along the way, they're going to end up falling into sin or whatever we're going to call it. And that person no longer is allowed to be the arbiter of what's marriage and what's not marriage and who's having babies and who's not having babies because again his biology is what trumped his conviction so until until we have some sort of reform for we're going to uh, kick women off of only fans we're going to kick women off of, of instagram we're going to say you ain't living right if you think shame is going to work let's just say for sake of argument it does work okay even if you do that you still have a lot you had a tough road to hoe man to get from it, well, it is it is a tough rope but even taking into account when you say praxeology i understand what you're saying and you're saying that their praxeology as your foundation of um we're studying behavior and behavior uh that's something which is necessary for like identifying descriptive reality and that's that's the kind of praxeology uh, that you follow right i'm not i'm not paraphrasing or straw manning that i'm just kind of like reducing it that's correct right what is Follows a bad word, but yeah. Spiritual absolutism, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the people who were in charge of the church for 2,000 years who were doing this, all they did was uh, see human behavior daily. That's what they saw. That Everyone that they talked to, they discuss. they have a praxeology as well. They still understand these concepts. They're not foreign to them. They've written about them. The church fathers have written so many tomes on how human beings behave with each other mm. outside of the Bible. It's mind-blowing. You well, think you red know, pillars have a lot of books out there? Read the church fathers. It's insane. Well, you know, well that's a great segue because, gentlemen, unfortunately, I have to go back tomorrow to facilitating the demise uh, of unhappy marriages. Nice talking with you, man. But, but nice. I will say that if you'd like to save your marriage, then there are... <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> I can recommend well two done. excellent well resources <laughs> here in the form of, of my books, which are also available on Audible and wherever fine books are sold. Uh, yes. And and so I, I hope you'll check them out. I, I actually think Andrew, and I do have to say, because Andrew and I spar uh, when we have these occasions, I, I enjoy more Me than too. I can put into words talking to you, Andrew. Me too. Um, we disagree on some things, but I have to tell you, I find you a pleasure to talk to and to deal with. And uh, I, I, I can't thank this whole group enough uh, for giving us a forum to do this. I have to tell you, hey, two and a half hours in, uh, we could do this probably another five know, hours and none of us would lose interest. And <laughs> yeah, I have to tell yeah. you, that says something, man. That tells us that we're onto something. I'm looking at the comments streaming along here. These people are hungry for this. They are hungry for this discussion. They're hungry for these thoughts, for these this, this kind of iconoclastic approach, these kinds of tough questions that we're asking of each other and, and, and of our society. So I, I have to say thank you to all of you guys for being here and what a pleasure and just to so be you know, invited. Before you go, uh, I don't take any any of this person. I've never taken any of this personally. Uh, debates, nothing. I just I just never do. And I appreciate well, the conversation. Uh, well, he takes it personally. I still don't even take that personally. But yeah, um, but I, I do have a, a lot of respect for the fact that we can do that kind of sparring and you don't either. It's a, kind of a breath of fresh air and I appreciate it. Listen, man, I, you know, I, I, all, some of my closest friends are my adversaries in court and, and jujitsu has certainly taught me that, you know, I'm always kind of break the arms and what choke to my best friends. So um, almost all my best friends have punched me in the face at one time or another. So great to see all of you guys and thank you for having me. And let's do it again real soon. James, we'll we're gonna Vegas. take you out in we're gonna take you out in Vegas, James. Yeah, we're going oh, to I cannot wait. Yeah. It's in the calendar and I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, all right, awesome, man. Hopefully, James, hopefully I can get you on my show on the ninth. I'd yep. love to. We'll Absolutely you. love right, to, Mike. Right. Speak to you soon. Take care, guys. Right, Be right, well. Thank cool, you. Cool. Uh before we get uh before we wrap up, I do need to get to some of these super chats here because I have been oh you've got a bunch been really lagging here. So let me let me start with PP here because he's always <laughs> like good. Down the go. Go. <laughs> Thank you, PP. See, PP has is so regular. He has his own sound Maybe. drop. <laughs> uh, let's see, Derek uh, Jameson is smart as attack. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Gallup, twenty seventeen. Very religious Americans consider divorce as morally acceptable. I already put that one up there. Uh, should Christian men marry single moms? Do you want to like mm. go real quick around there? I, uh, Glenn, why don't you start with that? No, one no, just, yeah, I, I, yeah. Go ahead, go, on, Mike. No, no, I want to hear Andrew. I like, I like, okay, me, well, do whatever you, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. We know what the percentages say. I actually want to hear what Andrew has to say about this. So, as an as an odd claim, there's nothing immoral. Nobody can make an immoral argument against totally marrying uh, somebody who's a single mother. However, in the current climate, would I recommend that anybody do so? No, and neither would most Christian single mothers. They wouldn't recommend it. So often this is uh, used as an attack against me because uh, my wife had a previous marriage and so therefore was a single mother when I married her. Uh, but she hasn't been a single mother in 20 years because I married her. You see how that works? But in any case, um, moving, you know, moving into this is an ought claim. Nobody has ever been able to make an argument for the immorality of that because it can't be done. But should, would I recommend it? Wouldn't recommend it. I don't no, think but you it's got, a great you, idea. <laughs> you got pastors like Matt Chandler and stuff like that. You know, Jesus are, wants the rose. You know, you got to marry the single moms. <laughs> do the do the right thing. And it's just like, I'm like, no, no, they're single for a reason. Part of the consequence of a divorce is that you're single. OK, and if they're single, they couldn't make that marriage work out. The odds yeah. might not work out for you either with them. Yeah. The reason oh, that it oh. gets tossed out quite a, all the time. Well, first of all, when I was writing the fourth book, Religion, uh, one of the uh, things that I came across, it's actually in the book, too, was uh, there are there are single women or single mothers ministries in, in dozens and dozens of churches. I went and did the research on all of these. In fact, there are conventions of not they're not pastors, but they are. Uh, Christian speakers who b basically specifically uh, preach and uh, speak, let's just say, to uh, to single to single mothers, and uh, even as far back as when Dalrock was still writing in on, on his blog, I mean, there was the you know man up and marry those sluts, turning in, turning men's masculine duty and obligation, and turning you know, a real Christian will go and marry a single mother because that's what the Bible said, and it's Christian charity and it's forgiveness and. You know, the Lord forgave them and so should you kind of thing. So, I mean, there is most definitely a pervasive, uh, you know, I want to say culture of single motherhood within at least in an evangelical well, church. Worship, worship of 
it. And the part of this is mm-hmm. feminist ideology. I don't disagree with you a bit. Mm-hmm. Try to remember, too, many, many years ago, this information really didn't even exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, this wasn't even yeah. out there for people to utilize as resources. So society has changed significantly, uh, even from when when I was younger and got married. But just so that you understand, there is no actual immoral argument but as a recommendation in in current society i think all of us would probably agree it should be avoided do you or you would do probably you, want to do you agree with the narrative uh this this concept uh, glenn i think we've talked about this before the idea of the woman who she was a stripper maybe she did porn she comes to a, a sort of an epiphany stage she finds a youth group uh, next thing you know, she's or she's found a church. She's going to Wednesday service, the singles group or whatever. And the the church is trying to uh, pass her off on the extremely sexually ex- inexperienced man who's also in the church. And so now the girl who has the 50 body count is is being pushed on the young single who doesn't have a ton of experience. And then all of a sudden, you, do you understand what I'm saying? You understand what mm-hmm. I'm going with this? This yeah. concept because we're supposed to be born again, the born, again, the, born the, the, the born again. She doesn't even have to be a reformed whore, Rolo. Not even to that. I'm, yeah, I'm using just, an extreme example. I'm just saying, like, you know, she just, you know, she's just been with a lot of dudes and then she comes back uh, to the, the church. The church is like, well, in order for us to give you this absolution, right, we, we have to have some authority to give you this absolution. And when we give it to you, it has to mean something. In order for it to mean something, we need you to then have these other men forgive you of your past transgressions. And then so we're going to try to push this. Like I said before, it's not just if it was a sexually experienced woman and man, but it's a sexually inexperienced man who followed uh, the rules of the church being sort of not forced upon, but encouraged to get with a, a, a woman who's been with a lot of people. You guys understand what I'm saying. Do you yeah. agree with that? Do you agree that that's happening, Andrew? I, I wouldn't agree that it's something which is widespread. I'm sure it happens. Um, I think that especially when you're dealing with Protestantism, because there's so many different sects, you can run into mm-hmm. all kinds of weirdo shit that happens across the board for sure. Yes. Um, but what I would say is I would say that the church that is supposed to be looking for something which is equally yoked, yoked, right? Not equal. Mm-hmm. We're not equal, but equally yokes, meaning the experiences are somewhat on par you, you don't really see these massive age gaps, though they're kind of touted all the time. Uh, age gaps in marriage are not huge. People usually marry within, you know, four, five, three six to, years of each other. Yeah, yeah, three to seven. Uh, it's, it's very close. And so this type of thing is not a common occurrence to begin with. And I think that as kind of society has been curtailing on itself and dipping on itself, uh, significantly as this information's out there, less and less men seem to be moving towards uh, that kind of, uh, you know, arrangement to begin with. So I don't think uh, I don't think that it's something that we need to necessarily worry about, but should be curtailed if it comes up for sure. I, I'll Andrew, get let me just throw that, hold like, on. Wait, hold that thought, Glenn, real just real quick. Um, I'm just going to throw my hat in the ring here really quickly because I get this question. a lot. In fact, I just fielded this on Twitter not too long ago where, you know, those red pill guys think this is this, and this. Hmm. And I'll I'll explain to you what my this is my take. OK, this is this Rolo Tomasi spitball and spitball in here. Um, I, I understand that the appeal of Christianity to women who are in that position when they get to b- between the ages of 29, 30, 31 years old and they want to do things the right way and suddenly they rediscover their faith and suddenly they get back to church and they want to make this guy wait for sex who she never waited, let him, you know, all the alpha males in her past, she never made them wait. I, I get that. We've had that conversation a million times. But my, my, the, 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 the conversation or the back and forth, the debate I was having with this young lady was she was saying, well, you know, the, those red pill guys think that, um, uh, you know, m- women can't have a sincere change of heart. And my message to her now as then is that, you know, no, I believe you would pass a polygraph test if somebody mm-hmm. actually asked you, are Agreed. you sincere in your want to sort of turn over a new leaf? I have no doubt you would pass a lie detector test on that. My 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 observation in all of this isn't meant to sort of wag a finger at you. It's, it's awfully fucking convenient that it's 29, 30, 31 years old. And maybe you've got one or two kids in tow from two, you know, two different baby daddies. That's what I'm talking about. Not your sincerity in it. What I'm, what, you know, maybe you have had a change of heart and you want to get back to the faith, whatever it is. I, I 100% agree about that. But I think that, and I, again, something else I wrote in the fourth book is that the reason why Christianity is so appealing to women is because of that, uh, that's that sense of forgiveness that goes along with that. And mm-hmm. then that forgiveness 
becomes doctrine. And that doctrine becomes the single mother's ministry. And that doctrine then becomes men. You, If you want to be a real man, true. you've got to go and man up and marry those sluts. And yeah. quoting so, Del Rock here. But like my, my point is, is, I'm not even saying that if, if I, I if that's the way it's going to work out and there's there's enough single women and they're just kind of like, you know, hey, I'm sincere about this. I don't think it is the church's purview to be encouraging men to do this if men want to and they are fully 100 percent aware of that and what they're getting themselves into. Then that should be on the individual for the man. And then right. also the women who who those men actually want to get with from the church or wherever else should be thanking God every freaking day that some dude said, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to I'm with you for the long haul and understand just the absolute experience extreme outlying rarity of a guy who would do that biologically and conviction wise as well. Yeah. So, so wait, I, think, I, I think that this is a fair, them? well, I think that this is a, <laughs> this is a fair criticism Both. across the board. So uh, I would actually agree with what you just said. You're absolutely correct. I do think that Christianity and Christian churches are utilized as kind of a pulpit for single moms, especially later in life to go in and say, listen, I've done a series of reforms. Now give me a good man. However, I don't think that that suddenly raises their value just because they've been reformed. So when you're talking about, especially in the Orthodox belief of theosis, right, uh, which is trying to become more Christ-like, try to understand that just walking into the church and making the declarative statement, I'm one of you now, it's not even allowed. There's a, uh, an entire uh, catechesis which is involved with this. And then when you're finally brought into the church, you still have to work hand in hand with your spiritual father for a long time they're not going to be like and by the way jim over here he's 21 years old and he's never been with a woman and i feel like you would be perfect for him right it's just it's not the way uh that it works so but i do think that you're correct in your analogy that of course uh there has to be a path of redemption for everybody for all heinous things that they do that's part of christianity mm -hmm. uh we redemption is part of it but that doesn't mean that suddenly their value is going to shoot up if they walk in and say that they come with all this baggage and luggage. Uh, and that also doesn't I, mean that they I, I agree. married either, though. Hold, 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 hold. I, agree, I agree with what Andrew's saying in that their value doesn't change. My point is I do feel like the – so just just consider this from the Merch. church's point of view. There has to be some, val or some authority given to the forgiveness of the previous sins because if there isn't, then there's no reason for – the previously sexually experienced, extremely sexually experienced woman to come to church in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there has to be like some carrot. There has to be some reward. And so when Incentives. they come there, they're like, by, by our church, like we're the church and by our authority, you should overlook some of these things because she has well, been redeemed. you're mixing so up I, absolvement. So yeah, absol absol I, I, yeah so absol <laughs> absolvement, absolvement is a bit different. So if you're talking about sin, we believe that it's this is a holistic process. So we think that sin is a sickness. And just like right. getting better from sin, it's a process. It's not, you can't just go in and say, hey, forgive me for this sin. And they go, oh, okay, then you're good. That's kind of a Protestant method, right? Uh, r rather, we look at it as a holistic. So uh, a sickness, which you're trying to get away from in a process. Yeah. And it, th that type of process takes a long time. While I agree with you that there needs to be some authority behind that process and some process to begin with for absolution, or if you want to call it absolution, uh, it doesn't work like you just walk in and they cross you and you're- No, no, agree, well. agree, agree. But the, abs <laughs> the absolution is for your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And, and sometimes it's spread to the absolution is a total reform has changed. And therefore, because she's in the singles group with us on a regular basis, her value has raised. You and I realize that maybe it hasn't. Glenn well, I agree. That I agree hasn't. that it could give her some legitimacy. But the reason it does is because it's a sign of virtue and men are attracted to virtuous women. That's true. Yes. And even a reformed virtuous woman is still better than a modern whore. Right. Like, I yeah. mean, there's no way around that. So at least from the from the perspective, I think, of an average man. Yeah. yeah. No, agree. Agree. All right. Awesome. Let's get to the more of the Super Chats. I don't want to. Okay, let me let me grab a few. That was a plane. Glenn, did you have something that's really quick to add? I think you. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna gonna you. Ask. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. We've All right. Let me let me let me continue here. Uh, female affirmative action removes male economic leverage that keeps marriages together. Women discriminate mm -hmm. in access to having sex and family. The two discriminations temper the other. 
Uh, where's this next one? Uh, oh, thanks, Rusty. Uh, genuine desire cannot be regulated by the state or church. Without genuine desire, marriage does not work. As Rolo says, no point in even trying to fix it from the outside. Thank you for that. And uh, let's see. Uh, how does Andrew feel about uh, having to share his wife's affection, loyalty, and submission with another masculine being called God the Father? I thought the Bible condemned open marriages. Come on. Well, that's man. rather cheeky. Yeah, Jesus. there you go. Well, well done. <laughs> nice, uh, nice, what, ecumenical. That's cheap. some hereditary atheism <laughs> stuff right there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Big brain uh, arguments. Make this a tricky hermeneutics. <laughs> <laughs> She's cheating on me with God. <laughs> yes. Uh, how do the parents, okay, this is a good one. How, how do the parents' values successfully combat the indoctrination of the education system, which is trying to instill opposing values to Christianity? Okay, so this actually, uh, we did address it, but I'll just really quickly go yeah. over it. You're going to get your value from your parents. You see the trend of homeschooling already going on, meaning that they're steering them clear of these indoctrination centers. But even if your children do go to an indoctrination center, it's still far better for you to be passing your values down as a way to combat and temper it. And you still see, even in modernity, that uh, most people who I would say were born based like myself uh, we were in those indoctrination centers are basically our whole lives. And it's not that it wasn't insipid and didn't hurt us, but I at least had my parents who were awesome giving me a counter narrative and helping me push back against it. Okay. Let me get this next one. Uh, a church would have an incentive to keep people together right now. The state has the incentive to break them apart. I agree. Okay. Uh, Joshua, the, the Joshua project, men, uh, can't trust churches to regulate marriage and divorce because they are ruled by feminists. Uh, the church will always side with the woman and I, something I have, we, we already covered that, but I also, let me just reiterate real quickly. If you read my fourth book, which is called the rational male religion, I go into, uh, exactly this, uh, the, the problem I think, and, and this is, might be also a, an impediment to the reform that we were talking about earlier. Uh, is that the the feminist indoctrination of those churches is also a commercial interest as well. So to put asses in the pews and asses in the seats, the doctrine has to in some way appeal to a secular feminism or a secular female empowerment narrative. However, we're going to like dice that one up. But the, the, the long and the short of it is if you want to have a successful church in any, I don't care what religion it is, um, you're going to have to appeal to that sort of modern, you know, Christian kosher, uh, you know, we're going to talk about women and we're going to have a different, uh, let's see, we're going to have a different sermon on Mother's Day than we're going to have on Father's Day. And Mother's Day is going to be praising women in motherhood and Father's Day is going to be do better. So uh, what's the next one here? Uh, even Hindus are increasingly getting divorced recently because they start following the West blindly. Yeah, again, uh, the another infiltration of the West. The Bible only justifies separations. First Corinthians seven ten through eleven. There you go. Uh, that's for you, um, Glenn. <laughs> uh, critical thinker. Uh, absolutely fantastic panel and discussion. I agree. Shout out to everyone. We need more of this. Yes, um, it's better than the debates that have been happening in the last six months. I'll give let it. Let me tell Thank you, you so that, much. Yeah, by the way, I was just about to say. <laughs> uh, highly doubt that any of uh, religion, church, pastors, nonsense sermons are bound to make a failed marriage work, just like marriage counseling. Okay. Um, do we have any stats on sexless marriage? I already put that up. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, hey, it's Rachel Wilson. Uh, women used to compete at being a good wife, uh, mom, hostess, etc., for social clout. Do you I think they that. still do that now? Do you think they that oh, they cottage core is a thing? Yeah, they yeah. still do they, to they a degree. Do, they just use TikTok. different. They just use different value structures now. That's the that's mm -hmm. kind of what she's alluding to. Is like, don't we want the kind of value structures where these women were trying to say things like, "No, I made the best cookies for the group of men that came home with the husband this day, you know, on Tuesday." No, I made the best dinner. You know what I mean? If they're going to compete mm -hmm. for the attention, we kind of want them to do it in the right way. <laughs> you know, so, Andrew, does Rachel compete over cookies? With my daughter, she does. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. She does. They that it's a continuous war for who can make the best cookies for me, and only that's I win. <laughs> okay, yeah, and Max, there's that's, that's, that's the oven right now. That's, that's right now, so, so, Mike. How does uh, Kylie compete for you? <laughs> for you? I am not going into that right <laughs> now. Going into, into that, I, I, I plead yeah. the fifth. Yeah. Uh, what if your wife has an injury and you can't have sex with her anymore? Is the marriage over? What happened to better or worse? Those are traditional marriages. 
Yeah. Or is that question towards me? Yeah, however, whoever. Yeah. So, so the way that I would address this is that you're going to have to deal with this, whether it's a secular society or it's not. So um, when you take one of these vows through sickness and in health and things like this, the Christian churches, of course, we uh, we talk about the miraculous and we talk about things like this. And we kind of discuss that you do have an obligation and a duty to, to take care of this woman who you loved. That's and she was supposed to have the duty to do the same for you or you in that position. And. I think that these types of duties do need to be pushed as values on society. So the answer to that may be that the church does say, no, you do need to take care of your spouse. I don't have a problem with that. I think that that's probably good, uh, good, a uh, good way to push the narrative. In other words, uh, uh, for Alexander for- good here. Uh, sorry, I, I blew yeah, past no problem. Your- I, I blew past his uh, his uh, super chat here. Uh, the whole argument seems to be about how to trap women in unhappy marriages, skipping to the skipping the root cause issue. Is can widespread successful marriage exist in a world where women don't need men and find most men unattractive? Hmm. Uh, well, yes. And I, I kind of will take this is claim and push it to the side because I don't even believe that it's true. I do think that women do enjoy in their younger years the luxury and privilege of who, what men they're attracted to based on what you know their perceived hotness level is. But then, you know, I see them a little later in life making some value judgments the other direction right. uh, pretty quickly. So there's that. And then kind of setting that aside, I kind of push this is aside for a separate reason, which is that women themselves will go the way that men determine society to go if there's a stigma in them not doing it. And so we do have control over this and we always have. We just for some reason have forgotten that. I think that half of the reason why we still hearken back to this, the good old days of patriarchy and and uh, well, what we think was patriarchy and old school religion and, and you know, sort of when is the pendulum going to swing back? I think one of the reasons we do that is because of the understanding that biology does, in fact, trump conviction. And so I think a lot of the doctrines and a lot of the I, I guess uh, the implied moral or social contract between men and women. A lot of that had to do with buffering the natural proclivities of men and women. In this case, we have because, again, of hormonal birth control, we basically handed over the uh, reproductive process of you know humanity to one you know, almost unilaterally to one sex right now that's what's put us into this position right now in the church in education in society in politics and everything else yeah um, well i would say egalitarianism which kind of rides on same your, thing. Yeah, same yeah, thing. on your ideology yeah. there yeah well, so you also I, have to remember that women are far more egalitarian communitarian yeah. uh and socialist uh, then men are hierarchical. M- women tend to be more communitarian. Uh, well, when it benefits them, they become very individualistic when it benefits yes. them as well. Yeah. I respect- women are just better at it. They're better at being egalitarian than guys. Well, I mean, that's I mean, that's it's it's, it's I, there are hundreds of studies that back this up. And if you want me to quote them, I'll be happy to go dig them out of my Twitter f- bookmarks right now. Uh, Tom Anderson, I respect Andrew's attempt at prescriptions, but it's a religious utopia that never existed. The best solution to teach men to play the game is to play the game well, regardless of the rules of authority enforcing them. Well, utopianism has been smuggled into the conversation. Not Mm -hmm. only have I never said it's a utopia, but any utopia is stupid on its face. Anybody who's advocating Mm -hmm. something that they say is a utopia. There's going to be all kinds of problems Mm -hmm. which exist inside of this system. But that doesn't mean that I can't say with some good authority based on historical standard and just logic that it's probably going to be way better than what we freaking have now. Right? (laughs) It's, It's ridiculous what we have now. Tom Utopia, Anderson. no. Tom Anderson again. Uh, no religious or secular authority can enforce genuine desire. I would agree with that. Now the and that sort of goes back to what you were saying there before. Is I, I'm still I, I even if you are trying to sort of like socially engineer or socially condition a, a generation or two of women to actually find a certain kind of man attractive is well that's I, I think that's grasping at straws it's it's almost like saying body positivity and fat acceptance ought to be something that men are attracted to as well mm-hmm. uh I, I i would i would make that 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 distinction between those two but like again it's it comes well, it'd to be the same like, thing that we have now right which is that 
beautiful people marry beautiful people, whether they're Christian or not, and ugly people marry ugly people, whether they're Christian or not. Well, well I don't understand the distinction you know, you know, here. You know, you have. I'll, 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 I'll meet you halfway on this because that's pretty much what Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge do. <laughs> their ranking systems. I mean, they have a tournament ranking system style thing for their things. So. It's like it's nice that you desire a hot woman and you're ugly as sin, but yeah, you're probably not going to get them Christian or not. I don't know why that's a problem for the system. You know, uh, neighborhood sniper, sup, Rolo, Captain. And Sartain, there you go. Uh, tidings we got to you. Thank you very much for that, Sir Jason. I already got to you. Oh, wait, here we go, Sir Jason. Uh, no one will change the marriage laws in this country, it benefits too many women. That's uh, actually a valid point. Uh, the marriage laws actually do benefit women, so how are you going to get them to vote against their interests, much less re engineer a society around that? Catholic religion lost all pretense of moral authority when they uh, protected child diddlers. Uh, deliberately putting them in charge of anything important to society is lack. Can I take Andrew's side on this one? Sure. Well, right now, teachers are diddling more kids than the priest ever did. So a lot if you're going to have that argument, you can throw it right too, back at him. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Frank what, what, talks what you about see is predators. Time. Predators go where the children are. So yeah. of course, uh, predators are going to go to the Boy Scouts. They're going to go to public schools. They're going to go to churches. Wherever there's access to children, that's where you're going to see predators. Now, to his point, the Catholics did do a lot of cover-ups on oh, some yeah. of that stuff, and that they should all they should have been held account for that years ago, and still haven't been held to account. But look, you know, I'm not a Catholic, so <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. Uh, let's oh, and here's that. And to follow up on this, thank you, guys. <laughs> so Father, Father Touchy gets <laughs> the more I watch these trad cons, the more I see that they don't understand human beings and incentives. Uh, where's the other one here? Uh, we're, we're catching up here. Uh, hand holding is lewd. Glory to our robot dog overlords. <laughs> Cheese tax. Hey, yeah, uh, that has to be a uh, John Fitch uh, uh, dig. Um, no, that's on me and the dogs. Cheese well, tax is a you. TikTok trend. Cheese they tax. give yeah, me these cheese every time. Yeah, I know. I have to pay it myself. Uh, pod, <laughs> it, pod, it just needed uh, more cappy. Aaron, uh, Aaron Clary for the win. I would have loved to have Aaron in on this one. Um, yeah, I like Aaron. Um, yeah, Aaron's a good dude. We're, he's, he's coming back. Today. I told him though he has to be this tall to debate with me, and he hasn't. Yeah. He hasn't. He hasn't <laughs> gotten there yet. So, oh, <laughs> so. Man, I know he's watching this today too because he just texted me a little while ago. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Domingo Chavez, this is way more intelligent than the usual whatever podcast debate of clickbait lunatics just blathering at each other. Need more of this? Yeah, you know why? Because we don't have a contract with Daily Wire. That's why. <laughs> We actually have talent, so we don't need yes. the clout just yeah, by yelling. Yeah. We actually have we have a, our incentive is objective truth. <laughs> uh, hi, Rola. Have you ever read the book uh, Church Impotent? Yes, I did. I actually that was one of the books I read before I well, one of the sources I cite actually in my um, my fourth book, as a matter of fact. Uh, it, it was good. It was a good read. Uh, okay, that's it. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's uh, let's go around the horn here. This has been a this is way better than I thought it was going to be. So uh, I want to just say thank you guys for for uh, following up and and coming back on the show, Mike. It's I think this is probably the first time I've even had you on my show. So uh, that's not a Zoom call, right? <laughs> and Glenn, thanks for joining us. Ryan, thanks for sticking it out. And a big thanks to uh, James uh, James Sexton for coming out. We're going to have him in uh, Las Vegas very soon. Uh, I'll just I'll just really quickly start here real fast. Uh, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. I'm driving down to Las Vegas in my bitchin Camaro uh, tomorrow uh, morning. So I will see you, uh, Mike, probably in the afternoon. Uh, we're, we have Access Vegas coming up on Thursday and we're going to be picking up the schedule. We have the Savo, the mighty, mighty Savo brothers, Kevin Savo and Rocky Savo are, are flying out if they're not already in Vegas right now uh, from Connecticut. So we'll be doing some some stuff with them. Right, Glenn? And um and there'll be uh, yes, there'll be more guests on uh, Access Vegas this week. And then uh, the following week, I'm going to sell out Mike Sartain right now and say happy birthday because his birthday is uh, oh, his birthday oh, week. I got to ask you a question. I'll All let right. you. Talk. So, okay. All right. So here's the thing. Uh, so Rolo is in a currently right now. He's in a WhatsApp group. Oh, with Jesus. 80 girls. I'm sorry. And I'm not I'm not allowed to be in this WhatsApp group. And they are all plotting the theme for my birthday party. And I just need to know, like, Rolo, like, how humiliating is this thing that you guys are going to do to me? To you? I just, like, no, like, like, to me, no, it's, very humiliating. It's very humiliating. Okay, cool. Because, like, I, I know, like, when I heard all the girls, like, hee, hee, hee. So that's what I do every year. I, like, I let my girlfriend and some other girls, like, plan the birthday party. And the girls show up. Like, last year, they know I like basketball. So they all showed up as, as cheerleaders. 
for my birthday party. So I'm curious what they're going to do this time. Yeah, I'm but sorry. Rolo, I but I put I put Rolo, I put you in there to police like things. I put you in there to not let this get too fucking out of hand. All right, that's why you're in that group. I'm not in the group. I have no yeah. say over it. Yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, Ryan, what what do you got going on, my friend? Well, it's just work. Book two is good. Brechtology one. I don't have the same spiel as the, as, <laughs> but whatever. Mm -hmm. Book three is going along well. The editor's seeing it now. So sign up to the sub stack. You can see how it's going. You see what's going to be in it. It's basically dread. All these questions I've been asking about the nuts and bolts of how you deal with a marriage of like a starfishy wife or a depraved marriage or generally being taken for granted. It It's the nuts and bolts of what guys have actually done to get out of those situations. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Christian or Muslim or even a fat atheist socialist. It all works because people are still the same. So sign up to that and get book three when it comes out in the fall probably you november it. uh michael <laughs> please explain your birthday one more time uh yeah so yeah no we're just going to well i, I don't want to tell anybody because i want dudes to show up uh every year I, I i usually have like 40 50 girls come and we have a birthday party and then like the day before uh, that it happens i tell the dudes like i so there's a trick that ready this is what i teach in my program if you guys want 100 girls to show up to a party you need to invite a thousand and if you want 100 guys to show up to that same party you need to invite zero just don't invite any dudes they'll all just show up so uh, the, everything about my birthday is a complete fucking secret and then the day before i tell the dudes and then they can show up to the only i know oh yeah you know and like my brother knows and like and the, like the, the cfo of my company knows yeah. no one else knows and there's a lot of girls that know too yeah <laughs> andrew give me give me your plug brother man yeah, my name is Andrew Wilson, host of the one and only Crucible, fastest growing debate channel online, to my knowledge anyway. Uh, you can't buy any of my books because I haven't written any and have no plans on doing so, but you can buy my <laughs> wife's book, Occult Feminism, and I promise the patriarchy will be stealing all of her royalties to buy Papa some new guns because I just love them. So make sure that you pick that up and appreciate it very much. Uh, it was nice to see all of you again, especially uh, you, Mr. Sartain. It's been a while. And Rolo, yeah. thanks again. Thank I hope uh, hope we can do it again. Thanks for coming. Shout out to guns. Shout out yes. to guns. And <laughs> speaking of guns, Trent Lawrence, what's going on? Oh, man, we got a busy week this week. We got Tiffany coming back into town. So we're going to be doing a lot of podcasting work. If you are interested in starting a podcast, you live in the Las Vegas area, hit me up. We got Red One Studios. Uh, we could supply your podcasting needs. That's where Mike, Rolo, and a bunch of other people go. So hit me up if you want to start a podcast at Red One Studios. There you go. Yeah. So I have to I, I have to take trend to be a high status man. Is that yeah, true? you didn't get the memo Troy from Troy? You didn't I'm not get taking that memo trim, from Troy? bro. Bro, by the way, one other thing, let me explain something, something to you. I didn't know this, Glenn. You go to Mexico and they don't have you don't have to get a prescription for I know. shit. They're, I know. they're selling trembolone in the fucking <laughs> gas station, bro. I was mm -hmm. like, what is this? They're selling. I was just couldn't believe it, man. They're selling like fucking Anavar and Winstrol in the gas station. I was like, what, yeah. what is this place? Yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. Hey, bro, well, right. are you bringing your gun to go shooting? I should I? I could. I'm dri I'm driving the bitch and Camaro down there. I might as yeah, well be a full go gangster. I might as well go full gangster on you. Hell, Andrew, when are you coming to Vegas? Are you coming up to to Reno? Right. I'm. I live in Reno, so if you want to meet up in Reno anytime, let me know. I didn't oh, know. Yeah, that'd be great. Here. Yeah, yeah, I live in Reno, and then uh, most of I, my family lives right around Sparks, man. Oh, really? Oh, cool. So you're not too. I'm I'm actually on, uh, out towards uh, Cold Springs right now. Like, oh yeah, that's you know, super that, close that way. Yep. Um, so uh, yeah, and then I spend half of my time in Las Vegas, which I will be tomorrow. Uh, check my Instagram by the way tomorrow because I'm probably going to be uh, live streaming the the trip down there. It's on on the on uh, Apple Maps. It says it takes six hours and forty five minutes to get from Reno to Las Vegas. I bet I can do it in five and a half. <laughs> mm. yeah well i mean i've made the trip many times you can do it yeah. in about three and a half hours with a pedal <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm my mclaren sure <laughs> that's right yes absolutely all right guys thank you very much oh and in case you don't know this is the this is religion is my fourth book a lot of the stuff we talked about today was in uh was in this book i figured i don't really plug my shit that much so all right guys thanks for thanks for coming by and i will see you guys soon and i am going to put this and we are going to to get out of here. Take care, guys. Bye. Of me. It was 
was my first time But I was just a kid when we met and went to bed Bitches will go to hell.